turns one and two into then pretty much the only left-hander on this circuit called the left-hander then the right-hander onto no name straight into the chicane which kind of if you look closely does include another left-hander that's not the full flow that we were using for the michelin pilot challenge earlier on today turn five the uphill the back straight west bend and then the downhill will complete the lap and uh, th when this place was initially designed in the 50s it was going to be about twice the length with some of the ideas still re represented with that uh, the kind of outbreaking route at turn one where there is an option to go straight on but not very far into the trees the paddock contained very intensely inside this one and a half mile circuit but average speeds are well north of 100 miles per hour even within the gt daytona class so as i say my name's johnny palmer delighted to say that jeremy shaw is strapping himself in for the duration as well jeremy we had uh, many decisions to be made yesterday within the gt daytona pro ranks as to who did qualifying and it was a first ever pole position for australian uh, legend i will say i'm a big fan of uh, matty campbell getting his first taste of uh, that pole award yeah, I did a really nice job, uh, Johnny, yesterday did, did, did Matty Campbell. He's only the second time he's qualified the car this season. It's generally uh, his uh, teammate, uh, Matthew Jaminet, who gets those uh, opportunities, and he's uh, done that very nicely indeed, in number nine, nine car, by having a couple of pole positions. So this has been kind of the dominant car this season. It's, it's three pole positions for that car. No one else has had more than one. Uh, and they've also had three wins. No one else has, has had more than one either. So they're in the perfect position to be able to extend their championship lead here this afternoon. Yes, yeah, so the Porsche starting on pole, but uh, with plenty of pressure behind. We have five different manufacturers represented in the GT Daytona Pro Class. One half of the Vass Vallis uh, Sullivan Lexus RCF crew with Jack Hawksworth and Ben Barnico starting alongside. Just 18 thousandths of a second separating the Campbell and uh, Barnico times yesterday. Uh, but bad news, as already detailed during our countdown to Green Show, our Michelin countdown to Green Show, about the 25 car failing its ride height check in post-race or post-qualifying check uh, test yesterday and it means that uh, that 25 car was put to the back of the grid and therefore john edwards is going to have to uh, really get his elbows out early on but jeremy this is a track well known for because it's so tight and really just a single line all the way around so tricky to overtake around here it is, and it's Conor Di Filippi who's going to have that short straw at the beginning of the race. Ah, okay. He was the guy who could put the car a third on the grid, like you say, but uh, that was lost. They've had uh, all sorts of bad luck, this uh, this team, this season. So perhaps this time, think something will fall their way during a race. But it's going to be awfully difficult to, for Conor. You know, he doesn't just go to the back of the class in GTD Pro. He goes to the back of the field, so he's got 10 GTD cars to pass before he can catch up with the tail end of the GTD Pro cars. So that's going to be a tall order for Conor Di Filippi. But... He's already done it once this season, John. He did it at Long Beach, where uh, the the car failed post uh, qualifying technical inspection, also, and he d and he did the job there. He got it all the way through to the front and was looking really good to at least finish on the podium. But unfortunately, a full course caution came just at the wrong time, and they missed the minimum drive time requirement by by a few seconds, basically. So. Uh, yeah, anything that can go wrong seems to have done so so far this season for that number 25 team. But perhaps today they could turn things around. Well, it would be one heck of a story, wouldn't it? As you say, just bad luck after bad luck. But then to win this race from the back of the field, or at least even to get on a GT Daytona Pro podium, would be some feat. For academic reasons, let me give you the time that Conor Felipe actually set yesterday, a 51.227, which means he's right in the mix. I mean, he qualified in third position, but, of course, all those times once you fail a ride out to check are deleted, but it would have put him third, so therefore the inside of the second row. I think because this is a combined grid and, you know, you haven't got any real estate between the fifth place GT Daytona Pro Car and the leading standard uh, GT Daytona driver lineup, then th row three is really interesting for me because Frankie Montecalvo technically is starting a row in front of everybody else in his field, but he does only have the outside line 
alongside, oh, mind you, that's all shuffled around a little bit because, of, of course, the, the 25 car has been put back to the field. So it's more even. We're going to have four cars at the head of the order. And therefore, I reckon now an easier line into Big Bend for Frankie Mantecavo because he will have the inside line and I'll up alongside him and behind fellow GT Daytona standard cars. The cars are being released from the pit lane now. And if you are here uh, around the circuit, you will hear the uh, gentle rise of engines and a variety of them. Of course, the four litre flat six of the pole sitting car for Matty Campbell, the five litre V8 for the Lexus, the three litre straight six BMW M4, which uh, will feature uh, in both the GT Daytona and GT Daytona Pro classes. Robbie Foley's, Foley's Turner Motorsport car promoted to eighth position effectively because of the 25 being put to the back of the field. Madison Snow getting used to his office for the next hour or so. And we should talk about Jeremy Shaw uh, driver uh, times and also how far these cars are likely to get should it stay green for, say, the first hour. These cars should comfortably do 60 minutes. Yeah, I reckon they should be able to do maybe, maybe 65 minutes, a little bit over an hour, uh, two hours and 40 minute race. So should be able to do it pretty comfortably, fairly wide windows to make it on two stops, so three stints. Uh, but uh, when, you rate the, when you rate that pit stop and you know, whether you change tyres, how many tyres you change are going to be uh, crucial aspects to this race. So it's going to be a fascinating contest, uh, I think, here this afternoon. So uh, two hours and 40 minutes appear at the top of my screen with the starting drivers all decided already by qualifying effectively. Whoever qualified the car yesterday must start the race. At IMSA Radio on Twitter, if you want to get involved and uh, ping us one or two comments in the opening exchanges, maybe some thoughts on later on as the race pans out as well. The initial stages of this race, unless there's a, a big incident, should really just be teams and drivers keeping their powder dry, staying within the right sort of area. It is so easy to lose a lap if you, I don't know, have a bit of contact in the first couple of circuits and then need to pit. So easy to fall off that lead lap. So the key is, certainly for the first 60, 65 minutes, to stay in the fight within whichever class you are in. And uh, actually, just before we get going, with cars now well and truly out on circuit and just warming the temperature, let's head to the pit lane and get a word for the first time in this broadcast from Shay Adam. Hey, Johnny Palmer. Yeah, a couple of stories to watch out for in the GTD class. If you haven't been with us all week, the Carbon Lamborghini lives once again after suffering a very bad crash at Watkins Glen through no fault of their own. They had to ultimately retire the chassis that they'd been driving earlier through the year. This car is one that they rented. It has run in IMSA so far this season. Ran at Daytona with TR3. And when I talked with Jeff Westfall yesterday, he said he would go so far as to say he likes this new car even more than than the old one. So big credit to Carbon for getting the car prepped, turned around and ready to be out on the racetrack for today's race. They start in the second position. The other car in GTD that we're not used to seeing at GTD is the 79 WeatherTech Racing Mercedes. Cooper McNeil sharing this weekend with Jules Gunion. That car started off the season in GTD Pro, but Mercedes realizing that they have a really good shot at claiming the manufacturer's title in GTD asked WeatherTech to step back to the GTD class, meaning that they now have three cars in that category. And amongst other reasons, Cooper McNeil deciding to step back into that category. All the same rules apply. 45 minute minimum drive time and seven sets of tires on the weekend for both. So if it helps out the manufacturer, WeatherTech obliged. Shay Adam, who we are going to be hearing from all the way through this race. Let's hope not too often in the first few minutes, though, and everyone can have a neat and tidy start. We're revving up for the start of the 2022 FCP Euro Northeast Grand Prix live here on RS2 IMSA Radio with Shay Adam from the pits, Jeremy Shaw and Johnny Palmer in the Haggerty Global Broadcast Center. 15 GT3 cars, all of the same spec. It's the driver combinations that differ. Head out 
of the final corner then at the downhill, turn seven, and we're underway. Yes, the clock is starting to tick down now with a good getaway for Matty Campbell on the inside of Jack Hawksworth. He's got the jump and forcing the Corvette wide of Jordan Taylor is Ross Gunn in the third place, heart of racing team Aston Martin. Loads of dust being kicked up in the background though on the exit of turn two. You've got to work your car from one side of the road on the exit of Big Bend to the inside of the left-hander and so far so good for the cars that have started this race in neat and tidy fashion from a long way back there trying to squirrel his way to the outside of the chicane so running into the uphill there was Madison Snow hard on the brakes to try and get ahead of the second of the Harton Racing Team Aston Martins that's been started by Roman De Angelis but no place change already we are at the end of the first lap if this stays green we could be almost at 180 laps by the end of the day but it is a big ask obviously last year's race was affected heavily by rainfall and lost us uh, well over an hour in the end so Side-by-side -side action into Big Bend as well. The Turner Motorsport BMW about to lose places, including to a fellow Bavarian Mark car. The BMW switching places there, so good overtake for Madison Snow on the starting driver in the 96 Turner Motorsport BMW of Robbie Foley. So elbows out already, Jeremy Shaw, but it has been a neat and tidy start nevertheless. It has had a good start there for Conor De Philippe. He's already picked off three cars. He got to Cooper McNeil and Ryan Hardwick uh, on the first corner. And he's also managed to get past Aidan Reid in the Rick Ware Racing Acura as well on that first lap. So good, good early charge for Conor De Filippi. Now it's going to be a bit more tricky, but also a change of the lead in GTD. Frankie Montecalvo losing out then to Robert McGuinness from New York, New York on the uh, on that opening lap. Yeah, so he started on the outside of row three, remember, with the 25 car put to the back. Everybody effectively promoted a spot from third and downwards. Nose to tail now between the right motorsport Porsche, the only Porsche in GT Daytona's standard, which uh, that car's been started by Ryan Hardwick, also making ground, therefore, from 14th position, getting ahead of Robbie Foley in the all-yellow Turner Motorsport 96, but Jeremy Shaw quite right to point out a lead change within GT Daytona with McGuinness in the 39 car, which is the Lamborghini Huracan, brand new car for that team, now ahead of Frankie Montecalvo. So car barn with Peregrine Racing to the four, but Montecalvo hanging on to his coattails for the time being. The 27 Harley Racing Team Aston Martin, started by Roman De Angelis, is hanging on to the third place as well with Madison Snow, caught up just in behind but Madison again making good ground in the initial stages meanwhile just hearing from Shay Adam in the pits that there is no drive or at least the engine note is well off for the Turner Motorsport BMW sounding like the car just having no drive whatsoever and that Jeremy is echoed on the on the lap times well down now the 96 BMW indeed so it slipped right back on that last lap and uh, Robbie Foley clearly not up to speed here uh, that's going to be another disappointing day, perhaps. Certainly a disappointing start for that turn of sport BMW, uh, a, a team that's based up in the uh, up in the northeast here. So looking for uh, you know, another great result. It's been a, a front-running team in this championship for many, many years, uh, but uh, it's all gone wrong in the in the very early stages, and uh, you know they it's. Yeah, not a good start for that team. Really, really unfortunate. Well, as you can understand, Shea Adam has made a beeline to uh, to Turner Motorsport. What do you know about their problem, Shay? Well, there was sound out of the engine this time. I was right. It was silent the last time I came by. They were doing a restart, trying to shut the car off and get it going again. While it was still in motion, they're having an engine issue, a misfire. It's not looking good so far, but Robbie did get the car re-going. And let's see what his pace looks like, because they're not looking like they're going to bring him in anytime soon. Well, the BMW, the yellow car at Turner Motorsport, started on the outside of row four and yeah, didn't get away particularly well at the start of the race. One of the Mercedes squeezing up the inside, which will have been Stephen McAleer in the team Courtoff Motorsports number 32, which started right behind it. But this is, uh, again, going back to the points made in the Porsche keys to the race that uh, it is so difficult to overtake around here. And then if you lose laps this early on, it's a two hour, 40 minute race. We're not even five minutes old yet. And unfortunately for Turner Motorsport, they are losing crucial ground. 
which might prove impossible to gain back again. But you never know with motor racing, so they will stick at their programme, be assured of that. Meanwhile, Conor Di Filippi up to 11th place overall now, so he has already passed four of the GT Daytona cars. He's in a pro machine, remember, you can pick out that car with its red door mirrors and the red rear wing end plates too. So it's trying to get up to effectively fifth place and then make it five uh, red cars, red coloured cars in uh, all together at the sharp end of the field. An early pit stop for the class leader in GT Daytona standard, Shea Adam. Uh, this is a drive-through penalty for the Carbon Lamborghini. I'm not sure why. I'll have to ask uh, lead pit lane official Johnny Knotts as to why he came down the pit lane. Oh, and just while well, on the notes of pit officials, it's an all-female crew this weekend, along with Johnny and uh, Taunt me McNamara. So how cool is that? But yeah, I'll investigate. Okay. Well, I've, got, I've got the answer to that question, Johnny. It's a drive-through penalty for changing lanes at the start of the race. Robert McGuinness isn't used to starting up front in this car. This is his best qualifying effort in this number 39 car. And you have to maintain your lane, be it inside or outside, if, uh, until you cross the start-finish line. If you deviate from your row before the line, irrespective of whether there's anybody alongside you or not, then you are penalised. That we, we've seen it several times in the past for different drivers. Unfortunately, now it's caught out Robert McGuinness, so he's going to have a lot of work to do uh, from the back of the pack. It was a great getaway. In fact, it was too great for Robert McGuinness. And yes, he's having to well, rejoin, not quite at the back. No, it is the back now, confirmed as Robbie Foley is back out on track and up to 14th position. So the only Lamborghini in the field drops to stone last. And from class lead to the back in the blink of an eye, that's how quickly things can happen. But we know that uh, Robert, Robert McGuinness and his teammates, Jeff Westphal, have a very quick car because they were able to qualify seventh overall yesterday with a 51.465. But second in class, only six thousandths of a second slower than the class pole sitter, which was Frankie Montecalvo's number 12 Lexus RCF. So I think it's going to be very entertaining now, as long as they stay out of the wrath of the, the stewards of race control from this point onwards for the 39 car to work its way by, because it's certainly capable on its lap speed alone. Matty Campbell, meanwhile, we're on to lap nine now, is half a second clear of Jack Hawksworth. It has been slightly larger than that in the opening exchanges, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, but Hawksworth certainly keeping Matty Campbell honest, Jeremy. Indeed so, and, and in fact, uh, Ross Gunn and Jordan Taylor, you know, they've closed in a little bit. They were uh, more than a second behind uh, in, the, in the third and fourth positions. That's the gap last time around was a bit, little bit less than a second, so uh, unsurprisingly, similar pace amongst top four in GTD Pro at the moment, but it's still like Faf Motorsports car once again out front. The fastest lap of the, of the race so far has actually just been turned by Jordan Taylor in the uh, Corvette, the fourth place car number three, uh, has set a best time of uh, 52.782. Uh, that, of course, is a new, class, new lap record because the first time GTD Pro has run here. The GTD class lap record stands to Matt Campbell, uh, coincidentally, back in 2019 when he was part of the winning team here for FAF in GTD regular at a 50.7. And the gap, therefore... Excuse me, 52.0, excuse me. 52.0. The gap ahead of Jordan Taylor is definitely condensing, but likewise between Madison and Snow and now the second-place car of Roman De Angelis. So uh, those cars actually staying in the same order, but De, De Angelis is definitely coming under pressure now from the, the two large nostrils on the front of that brand-new BMW M4 GT3, sported by Paul Miller Racing. So heading away from the manufacturer that they were previously well-known uh, to be racing with Lamborghini and now heading to the German mark with uh, Brian Sellers to come a little bit later on in the race as well in car number one. Madison Snow just turning up the wick a little bit and uh, you know, throwing that seed of doubt quite possibly into Roman De Angelis's mind. Top two right together now heading for the uphill section turns five. There are one or two additional corners, of course, with the introduction of the chicane for the IMSA WeatherTech sports car uh, cars. 
We didn't run that configuration of track earlier in the day for the Michelin Pilot Challenge, but uh, it serves to add just that extra challenge at the end of No Name Straight, and it means the entry onto the back straight is a little slower. However, once they get to West Bend, they're still kicking the rear end out, kicking up the dust as well, and plunging down through the downhill to complete the lap. So the Canadian run, Faf Motorsports Porsche in the plaid colours for Matty Campbell, who drives at the moment, and his teammate, another Matt, Mathieu Jaminet of France, to come a little later on. But um, the trick here for Campbell, from his first pole position ever in the WeatherTech Sports Car Championship, is just to keep things on the straight and narrow, which he's doing perfectly to this point. Jack Hawksworth ready to pounce should anything come his way, but it might be a long old wait. Then there's a 1.4 second gap from leader to third place car for Englishman Ross Gunn. And Jordan Taylor still with that fastest lap of the class so far and outright indeed, 52.782 in the bright yellow Chevrolet Corvette C8R. Gap is growing from Jordan to Frankie Monte Calvo, but we would have expected that because of the driver uh, ratings, if you like. Frankie, Frankie Monte Calvo considered by the FA to, uh, FIA to be a silver rated driver, but a very mean one at that. And uh, yesterday in qualifying, uh, you had to use one of your silver drivers. I hate using the term non-pro, but you know what I mean. Uh, they are the ones that are kept aside to uh, be involved in qualifying on a Friday, as it is this weekend. Still that dice for second position, livening up nicely. Stephen McAleer wanting to get involved as well and make it three cars in a line in the best of the Mercedes AMG GT3. So Roman De Angelis, Jeremy Shaw, got his arms full at the moment. Yeah, he has, hasn't he? And uh, a good little uh, battle there developing with Madison Snow. Uh, it is Madison Snow, that number one car for Paul Miller Racing, local uh, home race for that team, based just a couple of hours away from here, in possibly New Jersey. They've got a lot of guests here this weekend as part of the Paul Miller Group of auto car auto dealerships they've got 12 dealerships in that new jersey area and uh, that is the car that leads the the championship a former winner winner last year of the michelin endurance cup this year going for the, the sprint cup title because they had to miss the first race of the season at daytona the car wasn't completed in time but running now again in a very good third position at the moment for madison snow uh, in the meantime uh, Robert McGuinness has just managed to get past Robbie Foley, but Foley certainly turned some better lap times uh, over the last few laps. He's certainly getting a little bit quicker than he was, uh, but uh, he's still not quite yet on the front-running pace. Uh, and McGuinness now is, uh, has made that pass for, for 14th position overall, and poor Robbie Foley continues to struggle. Just running a little bit wide, I thought there, Matty Campbell, but everything was in hand at Big Ben because it meant he was able to tuck in tight to the white line on the exit of that corner. So the elastic band is just extending and then contracting between the race leader, Matty Campbell, and Jack Hawksworth. As we head to the pit lane, Che Adams managed to find Brian Sellers. Brian Madison is definitely the driver of the start of this race. You guys talked a lot about strategy after qualifying, not going the way you wanted. Was that what you discussed? Take hey, it up to third by uh, the end of lap five? I mean, it's what we told Madison we wanted him to do. Um, you know, it, that was an amazing start. He was ready to go. You know, I think that um, he wasn't happy with qualifying. Everyone else understands the situation, but uh, he was not pleased with it. And there's nothing quite like watching Madison drive when he has a little bit of fire behind him. Uh, so right now he's tucked up behind the Aston, and it looks like he has really good pace. Looks like the car is good. So um, it's tough to tell here. I mean, we're still super, super early in the tire life, so everybody looks pretty reasonable. What you'll start to pay attention to is the next 15, 20 laps, see where everybody drops off, where everybody kind of plateaus, and hopefully when that starts to happen, we're on the plus side of it. You guys did a lot of work uh, through practice with long runs. You're expecting that to be more in your favor as the session goes on? Well, I hope so. I mean, that's that's the hope. Uh, we definitely put um, all of our priority on that, and none of it really on on qualifying. So I hope that uh, I hope that it pays off for us. You know, in front of us, we have a couple really good cars that historically have been good on tire life here. You know, the Aston was uh, super strong here last year, and they were able to kind of keep the tires underneath them. And the Mercedes can usually do the same. So. Um, like I said, I mean, I, you never really know what to expect until the race, till everyone goes on full fuel and the same set of tires. 
uh, this would be our, our, I guess, our barometer on where it's going to go for the rest of the race. Madison said in the interview after you guys won Long Beach that you weren't caring at all about the Sprint Cup. Now with the championship coming down to the wire and you guys in the lead starting to care a little bit more. I mean, of course, you know, of course you care. But I think the big thing about this whole deal is you just got to go race by race and you got to deliver your best performance every single time, whether it's in a points chase or not, you know. So uh, I think our main goal is to try and get back on track. I don't think we've been very happy with the way our last two races have gone. Um, and we just want to get back to moving in the right direction again. And if that just so happens to result in that, then we did a good job. And if not, then we need to figure out why we weren't able to. Good luck the rest of the day, Brian. Thank you. Appreciate it. One or two things to pick up uh, from Brian Sellers' uh, chat there with Shay Adam in the pit. But uh, before that, need to mention a spin for the 23-year-old from Perth, Australia, Aidan Reed, in his 51 Acura NSX, the Rick Ware Racing run car that he shares with Ryan Eversley. I'm not sure whether there was another car involved with this, Jeremy. I don't think there was, actually. High and wide. No. Is that Big Bend? It is, yeah, the extra big bend. He was, he was out on his own. He had a couple of seconds either side of him uh, before that. Uh, let's have a look on the onboard here. Just the car, just, what happened there? Just mm. yeah, got a bit of a wiggle into the, the second of the apex. It's a double apex right-hander down at Big Bend. It's a really tricky corner. And it's uh, it, the car steps sideways in the middle of that of that transition between those two apexes. Then you're going to run out of road on the on the, on the outside. That's exactly what happened to Aidan Reed. So he's got a lot of ground to make up now. He's going to fall to be to behind Robert McGinnis. So one more position there made up for uh, McGinnis. And um, so the uh, so good news and bad news there. The, the four you know, it's it's the race leader here, Maddie Campbell, turning very very consistent laps all within a tenth of a second. That's a 53-1 last time around. They generally be doing 53-2s or 53-3s. Uh, and, uh, sorry, 53-3 or 53-2. And that was a little bit quicker, but uh, it's really pretty comfortable, I, I feel, at the front of the pack. Going back to what Brian Sellers was talking about, a number of interesting points raised by Madison Snow's teammate at Paul Miller Racing, but he called upon one of our Porsche keys to the race and the tyres, the fact that this track is uh, high wear and it's pretty hot at the moment, 81 Fahrenheit, or if you prefer the Celsius measurement scale, 27. And high humidity as well at 55%. So it's a warm afternoon and these cars are still... Jeremy, all on their qualifying tyres. Now, Frankie Montecalvo, I think he only did nine laps yesterday, so he's got quite a bit of rubber still to lean upon. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's certainly a factor that the teams uh, ha had to uh, to take into account yesterday during that qualifying session. And some of the teams, notably the uh, number 25 team, did very very few laps uh, in their in their qualifying session. Uh, did a total of six laps only. Number 25 car, number 23 Aston Martin, and did seven as did the, the other harder racing team, the GTD entry as well, and did seven laps. So, you know, the tyre wear is a factor here, particularly the left side tyres, because of these predominantly right-hand corners here. Those tyres really do take a beating during this full fuel stint here. So that is something that the teams have to, to take into account, and that's why some of the teams didn't run as many laps as they might otherwise normally have done in qualifying yesterday. That's Jeremy Shaw, I'm Johnny Palmer. We're live from the Haggerty Global Broadcast Center and bringing you every moment of this year's 2022 FCP Euro Northeast Grand Prix. It's uh, round nine in the championship, but GT3s only. So for the GT Daytona Pro Class and the GT Daytona Standard driver combinations, from Lakeville, Connecticut at Lime Rock Park, this fabulous venue which uh, has hosted GT only races within the championship for the last couple of years. But uh, it packs in an awful lot of fans and hopefully you got your place early so that you can see a good view of your favorite corner. All the spectating points mainly on the inside of the track, but that means that the engine noise howls around this place. The gear change down to the bizarrely to the uphill you're changing down the box there to negotiate the chicane that is utilized in this race today 0.7 of a second that's just about the same gap as it was when i checked 15 or so minutes ago between matty campbell and jack hawksworth it is fluctuating from time to time 
Uh, but uh, these cars, well, what is the time difference, generally speaking, Jeremy, between a GT Daytona hot lap and a, a GT Daytona Pro hot lap and a standard hot lap? It can't be a lot. Well, it, should, it shouldn't be anything at all because they run exactly the same technical uh, specification. So it's simply down to the drivers. Uh, and uh, Frankie Montecalvo uh, is you know, do, doing a, a really nice job there. His last lap time was a 53.0, which was almost identical to our race leader, Matt, Maddie Campbell. Uh, in, in, interesting, the last three laps for Campbell were around about 53.5. He's just, uh, and again, another one there, 53.5 for Campbell. So he's dropped off a couple of tenths from where he was uh, five laps ago for the previous, well, 12, 12 laps or so. So mm. uh, that's certainly, you know, as Brian Sells was talking about, keeping an eye on that tyre wear, see whether the lap times do fall away a bit. But, you know, the four leaders pretty much sort of maintaining the similar distance between each of them and Frankie Montecalvo not losing out much at all in the next, uh, in that fifth place overall car, first in GTD. Remember in the 15-minute qualifying session yesterday that you heard live here on RS2 IMSA Radio, there was just 18 thousandths of a second separating the plaid Porsche from FAF Motorsports, Matt Campbell's time, and Jack Hawksworth, and uh, even less than that, in fact, one-third of a... Uh, distance of that of that nature, six thousandths of a second separating Monte Calvo's Lexus time for Vassa Sullivan, 51.459 versus Robert McGuinness's Lamborghini, 51.465. And the next four cars in the green class, the GT Daytona class, were very closely bunched as well. Unfortunately for McGuinness, he's had to fall to the back of the pack because of that penalty because of uh, the false start if you like he was starting to change lane earlier than the regulations dictate so had to take a drive-through penalty for that he put him to the back of the pack but he has now worked his way up to 13th position still the fastest car out on track in daytona pro is jordan taylor's fourth placed chevrolet corvette c8r with a 52.782 the lead. That's right, Jeremy. Yeah, go on, Jeremy. Uh, and, and well, Robin McGinnis, he set the fastest time in GTD at a 42.928. So you're only just over a tenth of a second slower than the fastest of the pro cars as Robert McGinnis tries to claw his way back. He's closing in now on Ryan Hardwick uh, by uh, you know, a few tenths of a second a lap. So I think another two or three laps, number 39 Lamborghini should be with. Ryan Hardwick and at number 16, Wright Motorsports Porsche. But meanwhile, out front, uh, lap times again now very consistent. Now, all of a sudden, they went from 53 3s to 50 foot 53 5s. Uh, and he's maintaining that place now, that, that pace now, as are the other three cars in GTD Pro. And yeah, the uh, midfield pace is very impressive indeed. So, uh, McGuinness hanging on to the fastest lap in class the 39 car as mentioned that uh, lamborghini does have some very impressive single lap pace and jeff westfall potentially can pedal even more quickly when he takes over but it remains to be seen how they work their strategy now at uh, car barn with peregrine racing whether they alter things having fallen to the back of the field as the, the first part of the race has dictated at imsa radio if you want to get involved on twitter bringing points to the race that we have not spotted just yet trying to stay on top of everything it's a 15 car field so uh, obviously uh, relatively smaller than your regular IMSA WeatherTech sports car championship but I think it's more intense actually because there's so little quarter, uh, quarter given and taken around here just uh, a track that is a slither less than one and a half miles around and all 15 cars built to the, spe the same specification as Jeremy's just been detailing. Was that a slight mistake on the brakes for Roman De Angelis into the chicane? And Madison Snow is going to try and pounce now as they head towards West Bend. They were two abreast approaching turn six, heading underneath the Haggerty Bridge, but no way through at the downhill. But that is why it's so easy to just make a very slight error. And then your rival is right on your bootleg, Jeremy Shaw. Yeah, that was a good effort there by Madison Snow. We didn't get too brave uh, around the outside at West Bend because you can run out of that group there very, very quickly and that bridge parapet isn't far away. But certainly that BMW, that car number one for Paul Miller Racing has really good pace at the moment. And Roman DeAndre's just str struggling a little bit. All of a sudden, uh, that gap uh, to 
the, uh, the, the leader ahead of him, Frankie Montecavo, has, uh, has uh, gone out by about half a second on that last lap as a, uh, the, the, the tail of the Aston Martin wagged uh, going through the chicane. It was the merest drop of grit, wasn't it, from those rear Michelins, and uh, as he was trying to slow the car down, needed to get the turn in right, but he was off the apex as a result, and then his pickup of the throttle was delayed because of that as well. So I think that is tyre-related, as you mentioned. And maybe Madison Snow, even though Madison's been pushing, in fairness, in the Paul Miller Racing BMW from the off, looks like he might have a bit more performance rubber to lean upon as he goes now to the inside of Big Bend. Again, the BMW, even though it's a bigger car, taller, uh, roofline is higher than the Aston Martin. It seems to be more manoeuvrable. However, elsewhere in BMW land, Shea Adam has the number 25 from Team RLL in the pit lane. Yep, and this is fuel and left side tires only for Connor Filippi staying aboard. He's watching the refueler in his right side mirror. Gets the offer from the guy standing at the left front of the car and heads back out onto the circuit. So our first taker of left sides only. Gentlemen, let's keep an eye on this one. Interesting. Yeah. Jeremy? But very, Johnny, you're right. And uh, with uh, with 2 hours and 14 minutes to go, I reckon that, that that team thinks they can get to the end of the race here with just one more stop. If it remains green all the way, they can run just over an hour on a tank of fuel. And that means, a good, well, they've got to run 2 hours and 7 minutes, basically, uh, to get to the end, minus the time for the pit stop. So, uh, you know, that's, uh, I'm sure that's a st strategic decision by that team. And having made that stop, they've still got out still on the lead lap i believe so yeah i'm sure they are so that they, they are uh, back in the fray having made the pit stop and not lost the lap so great work by uh, bmw m team rll and in their position you can kind of forgive them for kind of you know going a different route entirely from a strategic point of view get the car in as early as possible and then try and win this race on uh, low fuel consumption and just drive the thing with your slippers on to the finish but uh, you shouldn't need too much of that because you say two hours and 14 minutes left on the clock when the car pitted if they can do two stints worth an hour and six let's say each then that could put them in a very good position however not a good uh, state of affairs Shea Adam for Turner Motorsports BMW M4 we know it's struggling with a misfire and it returns to the pit lane yeah, it does. It's in here now with the computer plugged in. They've taken the hood or the bonnet off the car. They're checking the air intake tubes that come in through the front of the car to make sure that everything is still secured as it should be. Trying to peek in and see if they can see anything that is out of sorts within the engine. But right now, the computer giving them the most answer that they need. They're going to put the hood back on the car and send him back out, possibly, or are they going to roll him back behind the wall? They did do a full load of fuel, so Robbie is good to go for a bit further. Maybe the computer was able to change something did not change tires on this car let's see drop it off the air jacks there's quite a bit of side damage guys i didn't yeah. see that earlier either now robbie is set oh he's going back out on the racetrack that is not the launch of somebody going back behind the wall so side well, damage is what on the right hand side jeremy do we think um D didn't didn't see to be honest no, but, okay. um, th there didn't seem to be a lot of urgency down there mm. in that uh, team and clearly they, they, they have problems there and uh, yeah it's going to be a if they assume they are continuing as that car yes it has left the pit lane so uh, that's that's the good news but it's certainly going to be a long struggle for that team really unfortunate meanwhile Conor de Filippi uh, in clean air now has just turned that car's best lap of the race 52.990 and he's about uh, about 20 seconds behind a good little battle that is going on between uh, Ryan Hardwick, uh, Robert McGinnis and Aidan Reid and all of those three cars pretty close to Cooper McNeil as well. Uh, I'll concur with you that Conor Filippi did maintain the uh, lead lap, but uh, he's not very far away from being caught. Now, those left side tyres will certainly help Conor, though, in upping the pace and trying to get a little closer to Aidan Reid, who was one of our early spinners on the exit of Big Bend in the only accurate NSX in the race. I was just concerned a little bit that maybe that uh, Conor would be causing the overall leaders, fellow GT Daytona Pro class leaders, a bit of a, a, a distraction, but I think the RLR, RLL BMW will be able to up its pace now with that fresh rubber, at least on one side. Through the chicane will go Matt Campbell and then heading down the back straight 
In fact, he's much further round than that and heading uh, out of the downhill and over the start finish straight as the second place car of Jack Hawksworth also fits fairly early on. This is what a couple of laps later than the BMW number 25 and down to Shea Allen. All right, let's see, four tires or two. Ooh, it's gonna be four tires for the Corvette. That is doing full fuel, no driver change. Jordan Taylor staying aboard for the 14 Lexus, four tires as well. And Jack Hawksworth is in for another stint. This was part of their run plan. Leave Jack in for a double to kick things off as we welcome him back to the Imsa WeatherTech Sports Car Team. Let's go for Jack as he gets rolling. He's in the fast lane. The Corvette needs to yield to him. The Corvette did not yield to him. I wonder if race control is gonna look at that because the Lexus was in the fast lane and did have to slow down for the Corvette leaving. That is not the way it's written in the rule book, but two very good stops from two very good teams. There was a significant jink of the steering column for Jordan Taylor, but there was no contact on the run out. But however, the, the lesson is, the rule is that you must yield to the car that is already in the fast lane. So the Corvette arguably had its nose ahead, but didn't have the, the track position or the pit lane position, if you like, as it rejoined. However, the three car is now ahead on the road of the Vassa Sullivan car, which is still being driven by Jack Hawksworth, so a shade detailed, no driver changes, but there is a positional change within J uh, GT Daytona Pro because the new third place car for the time being, Jeremy, is the number three Corvette. It, indeed it is, and uh, the uh, that's... Rose could, yes, he's giving up that position there. <laughs> yeah. uh, what I was going to say was the rules are pretty clear. If, if you're overlapping as you come out of your pit box, the, the car on the outside, as Shea Adam was just saying, that's already in a fast lane, that has priority. So you have to lift off. And that was, you know, but if you do that, you can easily cause an accident. So he heads up driver, I think they're by Jordan Taylor. Uh, on the next lap, he gives up that position as was in the 96 car back in the pit lane. This is going to be uh, a long day for that team. But yeah, so uh, he heads up driving, that'll allow Jack Hawks was back into that position. And interestingly, those two, having made their pit stop, they're only about three seconds ahead of Conor Di Filippi in that number 25 BMW, because he's already served his first pit stop of the day. But Math Matthew Campbell, by the way, in the lead of the race, he's got the hammer down. He turned his best lap of 52.9 on the uh, on the 34th lap, having, do having been doing 53.8 consistently. He's now turning some fast laps as he gets ready for his first pit stop in that FAF Motorsports Porsche. Yeah, but uh, Campbell's going to stay out for the time being. And Ross Gunn from second position will appear on pit road with the red door mirrors. This is one half of Heart of Racing team with their Aston Martin. And Shea Adam is watching their stop. And team principal Ian James is the guy who's actually on the pit board. I love it. He's the driver, the third driver for the 27 car. And when he's not doing those duties, he is catching the 23. It is fuel and four tires for the 23 part of racing Aston Martin. So again, every GTD Pro car we've seen, except for Connor Di Filippi, has done four tires. Full load of fuel, 24 seconds stationary for Ross Gunn. And he goes back out because, of course, minimum drive time being 45 minutes for the same for both classes means that Ross's day is not yet done. Yep, so out for a little more. The man from Buckinghamshire in the UK heading into Big Ben now, taking plenty of curve. Careful not to cross the yellow blend line as well, which drivers must treat as a concrete wall in one direction when they're returning from the pit lane to the racetrack, but invisible in the other if you're already on the racetrack and looking for the inside line into turn one at Big Bend. Uh, more news on the... Uh, Turner Motorsport BMW, that has now gone behind the wall. So it was another visit to pit lane, but not stopping with the team in the regular pit bay this time, instead turning right at the end of pit road so that the team, that the car rather, can receive more attention from more mechanics to try and solve that misfire. But diagnosis and finding out exactly what the issue is, is always the trouble there and trying to do it in race, a horror story. Now, good battle between the Wright Motorsport Porsche. So this is starting driver Ryan Hardwick jostling for position with Aiden Reed. They're ninth and tenth overall. I make that eighth and ninth, therefore, in GT Daytona. And uh, tucked in behind them may well be Jack Hawksworth as well, who's uh, just no, made well. a pit stop. Go on. Yeah, he's a, he's a couple of seconds farther back down the okay. road. Robert, Robert McGinnis was behind Ryan Hardwick. He's just on that last, that found a way past because Ryan Hardwick, I think, was kind of defending there and losing a bit of time 
to Cooper McNeil, the number 79 car ahead of him. But now McGuinness is, is, is in clear air and he's going to try and set sail away from Brian Hardwick, who still has his mirrors full of Aidan Reid in the number 51 car. Yeah, so uh, the seas are parting for Robert McGuinness a little bit here, A, because some of the GT Daytona Pro cars have pitted, but also some good overtakes and well-timed too. If you can approach uh, a battle pack as they're kind of engrossed in each other's movement, you can just slink your way around the outside potentially. And Robert McGuinness able to leapfrog a couple of cars, therefore, and now finds himself in eighth position, seventh in class, with Cooper McNeil, the next man on his list. Again, a little wide, this time from Hardwick's Porsche, the turquoise-coloured right motorsport car, and it has to leap across the road to defend from Aidan Reid. Also there now definitely is Jack Hawksworth yes. in 11th position, and he's bringing Jordan Taylor with him. Hawksworth to the inside of the downhill and gets the position. These are all four positional places, even though it's one class, Daytona Pro, overtaking another Daytona standard. Yeah, and Aidan Reid being pretty sensible there, I think, not making it too difficult. Hopefully he'll do the same here. Uh, for uh, Joe Jordan Taylor, who is behind him, and Ryan Hardwick also uh, allows uh, Jack Hawksworth to go through there. Not sure Jack was going to give him much option, but he has done so in any case. So both of the pro cars now are moving past Ryan Hardwick, and that's going to give Aiden Reed perhaps an opportunity as they head on to uh, No Name Straight here to maybe make a move down to the uh, the chicane. Diving to the inside, I think, is Aiden Reed. Has he made that pass? Tricky to say, to say from uh, this vantage point, but uh, it was Nip and Tuck heading towards West Bend, and they will stream across the line in a moment or two. Matty Campbell still happy to stay out as the race leader. He's just ticked off 40 laps now, heading through the really quick stuff towards the end of the lap, underneath the Haggerty Bridge, and then downhill through turn seven, and he fades to pit lane from the number nine Faf Motorsport Porsche. Answer, no. He's happy to plough on. So we've been going now for just over 35 minutes and the race leader is Matt Campbell in car number nine. Second place is also a class leader, Frankie Montecalvo in the number 12, Vassa Sullivan Lexus. Then it is the 27 Aston Martin for Roman De Angelis. That car yet to make its first stop, running in third position ahead of Madison Snow's BMW. Fifth place for the number 32 Mercedes of Stephen McAleer. Fifth in uh, overall, that is, fourth in class. And uh, fifth in GT Daytona standard is the 57 car, which is the Winward Racing Machine, started by Russell Ward. Positions in GT Daytona Pro. Well, you have to look down to ninth place overall for Jack Hawksworth, who has made a stop already. Right with him is Jordan Taylor in the Chevrolet Corvette. And the FAF Motorsport Porsche is heading for the pit lane. Those positions are the latest then. That's your VP Racing Fuels in-race update as we head to Shea Adam to call the stop for the race leader. Will not be a driver change at this point in the race. Matty Campbell staying aboard. They have four new Michelin tires. These ones do not have the stickers on them, only because the crew has diligently peeled them off, although I'm sure little bits of glue are still left in those stickers. The tire change is already done in 14 seconds. Wow, that was fast. Now waiting on the fuel, which of course goes in through the hood of the car, meaning that Matt has a perfect view of when he is safe to leave. 20 he goes Matt Campbell, perfect clear shot back out onto the racetrack. He gets beaten by both the Lexus and the Corvette, though. So maybe yeah. a little bit more fuel going into that car. There was more space for it because it's burned more in the early part of the uh, of the race, Jeremy Shaw. But Matt Campbell giving up track position as Jordan Taylor goes around the outside or at least tries to through the left-hander. And Jack Hawksworth had to make sure that he was then on the inside line for the right-hander. But Jordan Taylor spotting this opportunity for the overtake, which will ultimately be for the overall race lead through all of this traffic. Yeah, great stuff there, really interesting. And uh, after their pit stops there, the number 14 car and the number three doing some really good laps, taking advantage of their fresh tyres and using that clear track ahead of them for most of that time until they call that little train of GTD regular cars uh, to great effect because even though Mandy Campbell uh, over the last uh, seven or eight laps turned his best laps of the race on two of those particular laps, 52.96 was his best, uh, Jack Hawksworth turned a 52-4 on his fresh tyres, uh, and uh, as a result of that, he's leapfrogged 
both of those cars now in the lead of the effectively in the lead of the race of those who have made a pit stop. So really good work by Jack Hawksmith. And yeah, they're just waiting for the final, uh, for the end of the fuel to go on board that number nine car. And away goes Campbell pretty darn quickly. He didn't uh, hang around there. So yeah, a little bit more fuel on board that car. Uh, because they needed more, as you say, and it also means you know, that maybe they'll have a little bit less to put in at the final stop as well. Yeah, because uh, generally, if you're going to find an advantage somewhere, there's a disadvantage to that somewhere else. It's uh, the balance of the universe, if you like, and if you gain a bit of time by, um, by putting less fuel in at the stop, as Jordan Taylor then tries around the outside into Big Ben, but the WeatherTech Mercedes of Cooper McNeil is standing in his way and Cooper quite rightly standing his ground as well. He is eventually overtaken for that position, which is sixth overall by Jack Hawksworth and Jordan Taylor in one manoeuvre. But Jordan's got to be so careful here to not allow some of the GT Daytona traffic to drive a wedge between what will be the overall leader when all the pit stops have been done, Jack Hawksworth and his second-placed Corvette, although they are running seventh and eighth in the overall standings at the moment. Matt Campbell with a heavier car, and uh, you can almost tell that from the body language of the number nine FAF Motorsport machine. He tried to go for a manoeuvre not too long ago into the first corner on Robert McGuinness, but McGuinness's car is getting lighter and is a fast car as well, the Lamborghini Huracan, uh, number 39 from Carbon with Peregrine Racing. First stop of the race, Shay Adam, as we hit two hours still to go for Madison Snow, who's already away. What did you uh, make of that stop? And well, he stayed aboard the car, which was part of the plan, but they did give him four new Michelin tires and a lot of fuel. So Paul Miller looking to go further into this race with their starting driver than a lot of other people. I haven't yet seen a lot of the teams that we suspect who will come in at the 45 minute mark get ready, i.e. Uh, right Motorsports still look fairly calm. But look for the Cawthorne Mercedes, that's number 32, the Peregrine uh, Carbon with Peregrine Racing Lamborghini, that's 39, and maybe even the Windward Mercedes, that's number 57. They're all looking a little bit antsy on their pit walls. Okay, so uh, no doubt they are thinking about when to make the first stop. I mean, these cars could still continue to an hour and 40 to go, an hour and 35 to go uh, pretty easily. And that's what, remember, Conor Filippi and the 25 crew together with teammate John Edwards with the BMW M Team RLL. They pitted with two hours and 14 minutes to go. That amount of time is sort of penetrated on the inside of my forehead, Jeremy, because I think, <laughs> you know, they're trying to make it on a fuel race and burn as little as possible in the next two, two stints, one stop. And the, the uh, critical aspect of that uh, strategy there for the number one team is that they know Madison Snow is quick uh, and they feel, I believe, that he was being held up by Roman DeAndre. So bring him in a little bit early, get on a fresh set of tyres and try and do exactly what the Lexus car number 14 and Corvette number three did to the number nine car. Turn some quick laps now before the other GTD leaders come onto pit lane to change uh, to, to make their first stop of the day. And of course, because Madison is quick, he's going to stay out in that car when the other cars come in. And it's still not yet to the 45 minute uh, point in this race. So it's it's too early to change your drivers and fulfill the minimum uh, minimum driver requirement. So that is why the other cars are not coming in to to follow that lead just now. And that's going to be really interesting to see how that plays out later on. We're going to see several teams, certainly the ones at the back of the field in GTD, make their stops as soon as they possibly can to hand over to the pro driver, uh, where there's, there's more of a difference between the two drivers' pace. But Madison, as we've seen before, he's pretty quick. Uh, and uh, even though Brian Sellers uh, is the, uh, the, the more experienced driver, Madison is plenty fast on his own. And they're, they're com comfortable with the, with the decision that he can maintain his pace once the other pro drivers get aboard the GTD pro, uh, excuse me, the GTD regular entries. That's Jeremy Shaw joining me, Johnny Palmer, in the Haggerty Global Broadcast Centre at IMSA Radio for all your discussion topics throughout the race, things that creep into your mind about why is a team not doing this, why are they choosing to pit so early, perhaps. And uh, remember that we'll have a full discussion at the end of the race as well. The chequered flag is not uh, just the end of the race, but it's the start then of our post-race tech, our post-race discussion. 
at, uh, or rather, use the hashtag MichelinPRT within your tweet for that. But uh, I would possibly hold back a little bit longer on those tweets because uh, you never know what this race has to give to us uh, with an hour and 55 still to go. We will, though, in the next 30 seconds, have hit that magic 45-minute marker. So are we going to see some movement from one or two teams purely dictated by drive time rather than uh, fuel in the tank, rather than tyre wear? A lot of this hinges on doing your minimum drive time for the, uh, the less quick driver, if you like. And uh, that's going to happen in the next lap, pretty much. Jay Adam reckons yeah. there's a lot of movement potentially on the pit wall just around the corner, Jeremy. Yeah, there will be, absolutely. It'll be a busy place in uh, probably uh, next time around, actually. The 45 minutes will be elapsed by then. So I would expect uh, certainly uh, at the back of the field, I, I would think probably the, the leaders will come in too because uh, Frankie Montegalvo doesn't want to lose too much time uh, if Madison Snow is going to get out there and turn some really, really quick laps, uh, which uh, he has just done. He's just turned his best lap of the race, uh, and that is the fastest lap of the race overall, in fact, wow. for Madison Snow, a 52.374 for the number one car. So brilliant lap times there for Madison Snow. That's exactly what the team wanted him to do. And he's actually now trying to get past Conzi Filippi in the factory car. Well, when on earth is this bad luck for the 25 going to come to an end? Because Connor's just had a massive spin on the home straight. And uh, Shea Adam thought that maybe a car checked up in front of Conor Di Filippi. It resulted in a spin and he had to have several attempts at rejoining the racetrack. That's more crucial time lost for this car as it's getting so busy in the pits now, Shea. That's exactly what happened, Johnny. Uh, Cooper McNeil in the... 79 WeatherTech Racing Mercedes jammed on the brakes to try and come into the pit lane, and Connor tried to avoid it and went going into that massive spin. We've also had Wright Motorsport in. Jan Halen is now behind the wheel of that car for tires and fuel. We've got Stephen McLear in for Team Cawthorpe. He's staying here. Mike Skeen taking it out for tires and fuel. Aaron Tielitz is now the pilot of the number 12 Lexus. Again, four tires and fuel, four tires and fuel for the 27 Heart of Racing Aston Martin and Maxime Martin now driving that. And finally, in Windward World for that Mercedes, Russell Ward got out and it was Phil Ellis who took over. And now we have the 39 Carbon Lamborghini. That is a driver change. Robert McGuinness out, Jeff Westfall in. So that's, uh, what, six cars of the 15 coming in as soon as they can. So old tyres being skated away, new ones applied to the 39 Lamborghini Huracan. We talked as well during our Porsche keys to the race at the start of the broadcast about being smart during pit stops, particularly if they are green flag stops just like these. You will lose around about a lap, but it's time to be patient and know that that lap will come back to you. So what happened with Conor Di Filippi a couple of laps ago? He's coming through the right-hander at the downhill. Oh, and Cooper McNeil was looking for the pit lane and Conor Di Filippi wanted to go straight and down the main start-finish part of the, the lap. So Cooper McNeil trying to stay as far right as possible. That's just a little bit of the nature of this circuit where you are well, trying to pick up the throttle but the car in front wants the pit road jeremy yes and no i mean the the, uh, the etiquette here as you're coming down the hill you signal with your hand uh, to the car behind you whether he sees it or not of course is a question but once again just no luck at all for this number 25 team this season i mean you can't blame them for that he obviously didn't realize number 79 car was coming down the hill one hopes that Cooper McNeil would have made that signal, but we don't know that for sure. Uh, because uh, I'm sure if he had made the signal, then number 25 car would have given him more space coming out of that corner. Uh, these, so, uh, these race cars, do so they have working turning lights, indicator lights, which you could also flick on as an option? Yes. OK. So Cooper McNeil could very easily have done that as well, maybe through West Bend to say, I'm coming down pit road, just be aware of that. And Conor Di Filippi would have taken a deliberate wider exit, therefore, out of turn seven. So I think what you're trying to say is that was an avoidable incident regarding a car that wanted to pit and another one that wanted to stay on the racetrack. Indeed so. Uh, yeah. And, and uh, the, just uh, Matty Campbell's just turned his car's best lap of the race, 52.590 for Campbell. He's now closed in onto the tail of the Corvette car number three, which is tracking Jack Hawks with the number 14 Lexus. So once again, we've got this, uh, we've got a three car battle now because Ross Gunn, after that first round of pit stops, he's fallen a long, long way behind 
12 seconds back in the fourth position after all of them have made one pit stop. Uh, and then uh, Aidan Reed uh, is next up on the road, fifth overall. He's about 14 seconds further back. He has yet to make his first pit stop to hand over that car to Ryan Eversley. And then, with that strategy to come in early, Madison Snow has leapfrogged the other GTD uh, leading car. So of the cars that have made a pit stop, Madison Snow in car number one is in the lead. And when he came in with uh, just two hours remaining, no question, he can make one more stop, hand over to Brian Sellers to the, the final hour of this race. Can he maintain that position? He's got a good lead at the moment. He's got about uh, five or six seconds, I think, over Aaron Tielitz in the number 12 Lexus. Yeah, Tielitz, the new driver, into the 12 RCF GT3, taking over from Frankie, Frankie Montecalvo. Also, uh, we had a driver change with Philip Ellis in the 57 Mercedes, which is the entry from Windward Racing, sharing with Russell Ward, who started the car, and Ellis under quite a bit of pressure right now from Mike Skeen's similar car, number 32, the team caught off Motorsports AMG GT3. They're absolutely nose to tail for ninth and 10th in the overall standings. Aidan Reed has just pitted ahead of those guys in the Acura NSX, so falling to at least 12th position because Jules Gounon, new driver into the weather, the tech racing at Mercedes AMG uh, up to 11th spot now as well. But it remains to be seen how much damage has been done to the rear of the all white WeatherTech Mercedes as well, because that was a fair old biff coming out of the right hander at the downhill, uh, which caused the 25 BMW to spin. We'd spoken a lot about the team RLL car, but has that damaged the diffuser potentially on the third of those Mercedes running ninth, 10th, and 11th? All three AMGs together on the timing screen as rounding Big Bend is the Aaron Tielitz driven Lexus RCF from Vassa Sullivan. And he's just arriving on the scene with a lapped Ryan Eversley in the, in the purple NSX, which he deals with very quickly indeed. That was good driving as well from Eversley as we head to the pit lane and Shay. Down here with Frankie Montecalvo, fresh out of the number 12 Lexus. Frankie, that's how you're supposed to do it from pole position. Lead the whole stint, put in some blistering lap times. Number 12 Lexus looks like it's feeling pretty good, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, we were lucky. Got, we stayed out in front during the start and uh, had some really clean air. So it was nice to, you know, not have pressure behind, create a little buffer, take care of the tires and try to keep that average pace up for the entire stint. So that was my goal. Came in, no contact really whatsoever. So the car's doing really good. It's in perfect shape for Aaron to finish to the end. Now, he's going to have to do another pit stop. Fuel and tires, are we looking at four tires again? Because you did four tires in that stop. Yeah, yeah, that was obviously our qualifying tires, so they were a little more beat up. I think it's going to come down to a, a tire fuel strategy till the end. It really plays if, uh, if we have any yellows, which is going to change up the race. I know some of the other cars out there don't perform as well when it gets hotter. There are some clouds around. What helps you guys? Clouds or, you know, direct sunlight? I think it's going to do uh, a lot of clouds will help us driver wise and the car. It's just going to, you know, everyone goes better in the in the cool. All right, I'll start doing my cloud dance, mostly for me, but a little for you guys. Thanks, Frank. Well, someone who's trying to seek out uh, much better luck. Think about Canadian Tire Motorsport Park in the previous round when Frankie Montecalvo had, had uh, put his car on pole position and then was involved in a turn one incident, not at all of his making, which put the car out of contention north of the border. Going a little better this time around in the very next round and also livening up for second position between Jordan Taylor and Matt Campbell because theoretically the heavier car of the two is making strides, making progress very good on the brakes into Big Ben there. Matt Campbell closing in an awful lot on the... Uh, recently mid-engined, of course, what was at the start of 2020, they changed the configuration of these Corvettes, no longer the engine in the front, now right behind the firewall of the seat position for Jordan Taylor. And he's just starting to lose touch a little bit here, Jeremy, of Jack Hawksworth, with a lot to deal with from behind. Indeed so, and uh, you know, Jack is able to uh, extend his lead a bit uh, with this battle going on in his, w in, uh, in his wake with... Uh, Campbell trying to get away past uh, Jordan Taylor uh, for second position. Uh, right behind them is uh, that's Jules Gunon, isn't it? In the uh, the uh, number 79 card, it, it is a lap down to the uh, to the leaders after that round of pit stops. 
Yeah, but uh, I'm encouraged by the fact that Jules can keep with the pace of the second and third placed oh, Daytona he's Pro cars. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, but I was bothered about the car being damaged after it was given a big old thump. But so far, the air is leaving the underneath of that car pretty well. No, you don't need to convince me of Jules Gounon's credentials <laughs> at all. I mean, he's super fast. And as you say about uh, these cars being all the same regulations, it's just the drivers that are different. And Gounon... If he was on the lead, lap would be truly challenging for second place here, but he's just looking to untangle himself so that he can get back with some fellow GTD drivers. Yeah, he'll, he'll be trying to get past them, in fact, and, uh, and, and get get onto the... Uh, I mean, he hasn't yet been lapped by the, cla by the, by the class leader, but, well, if, if, there is, if there is a full course caution, then he would be able to, to cycle past the uh, safety car and, and get round to the back of the field. But uh, he'd certainly like to pass these guys if he, if he possibly can. I mean, he's driving Mercedes there in a Porsche and a Corvette. Well, Lex is ahead of him, so he wants to make that point. He wants to show mm. how good this Mercedes is. Yeah, he's and... Uh, yeah, Jack Hawksworth is, is, uh, is loving this battle going on in his wake because he's all of a sudden stretched his knee down to 1.6 seconds in that leading Lexus. Yeah, this is tricky for Matt Campbell because obviously he's got to pay attention to what Gounon's going to try here, but they are in different classes, and really Matty's saying, just leave me alone, Jules. I need to concentrate on getting by Jordan Taylor in the bright yellow Corvette. There's a bit more breathing space as they head out of the downhill and back across the stripe. So does that mean that the Corvette and the Porsche are marginally better on the fast stuff, but the Mercedes will close up again? I think it's very strong through turns three and four, the left-hander and the right-hander, as they are labelled here at Lime Rock Park. You're tuned to RS2, IMSA Radio, part of the Radio Show Limited network of channels. It's Jeremy Shaw and me, Johnny Palmer, in the Haggerty Global Broadcast Centre at IMSA Radio to get involved on social media. I'm sure plenty of questions are already pinging into your minds regarding our post-race tech show. And uh, in about an hour's time, you can certainly start firing those to us in a tweet using the hashtag Michelin PRT. But uh, a really good dice for second and third overall, which also involves one of the GT Daytona cars in the form of Jules Gounon. Definitely hanging yeah. on to uh, uh, Jordan Taylor and Matty Campbell. The bonnet of that Mercedes just rippling very slightly, but the clip's hanging firm for the time being, Jeremy Shaw. Yeah, and Jules Gunnar has set the fastest lap of the race at 52.109 for the Mercedes driver, car number 79, that Vezetek racing uh, Mercedes AMG GT3. And uh, the uh, the lap record here for GTD is a, is a 52 point. 048 set by Maddie Campbell. So he's within half a tenth of a second of that lap record is Jules Gouillon. Uh, so he's got a really fast guy. He set that on the having just, uh, just shortly after the pit stop when he took over from Cooper McNeil. So we're going to hope he doesn't push those Michelin tires too hard too early in this stint. There is, uh, it looks like almost a bit of BMW wrap dangling from the diffuser of Jules Gounon's car, but otherwise the strakes seem to be more or less perfect. So clearly WeatherTech Racing and the 79 car, which the car at the time was being driven by Cooper McNeil, they appear to have got away with that. And that car then looking to certainly stay on the lead lap for GT Daytona. And uh, if it can get ahead of Matt Campbell and Jordan Taylor, that would help them immeasurably as well. But just at the moment, meeting the same sort of lap speed as the second and third place cars overall. Ross Gunn is further down the road. Gap to the leader to Ross is actually 12 seconds or so. But they are all working lap 65 currently. And Madison Snow at the top of the shop in GT Daytona regular with Aaron Tielitz only 3.2 seconds behind. Yeah. Is that gap coming down very slightly, Jeremy? Yeah. It is, and not only that, Aaron Tielitz got past Conor Di Filippi a couple of laps ago and has left him for dead. I mean, he's pulled away rapidly and already uh, three and a half seconds ahead of Conor Di Filippi. That's Aaron Tielitz in caliber 12, that's second place Lexus in GTD. So he is absolutely flying at the moment. We've got Lexus first, of, first overall, of course, with Jack Hawkins, leading GTD Pro. And Aaron Tielitz, he's got his sights set on Madison Snow with the lead of GTD regular. Thumping the curves again, Jules Gounon wasting absolutely no time there. And 
certainly not caressing the car through that part of the uh, the course but these modern day gt3 cars will easily take this punishment they're built i suppose to race 24 hours at places like well, daytona certainly the nurburgring nordschleife spa 24 hours as well so uh, whacking a couple of curbs on that uphill section on the inside of turn five shouldn't fluster the car set up too badly at all but he's got his arms full here Jules Gounon not leaving anything on the table flick of the tail leaving big bend and uh, definitely getting the crosshair set on the rear of Matty Campbell's car actually just ahead of it I would say because they're going to draw level now and Campbell says do you know what if you want the place that badly Jules you can have it because you're causing me more of a distraction than anything else so he will allow Jules Gounon through to unlap himself on the number nine Porsche and hope well Matty Campbell will hope that Jordan Taylor does similar so that they can connect their battle for second and third overall but I just wonder whether that Jeremy was Matt Campbell saying I'm wasting a bit too much time here looking in the mirrors needlessly I'll let you go by yeah I think so uh, because uh, you know it's not a, a, a battle for class position it's only overall position and uh, for Campbell he clearly uh, isn't able to find a way past Jordan Taylor clearly or cleanly at this stage. So if he can uh, leave the road, if he can follow in the, in the foot tracks uh, of wheel tracks of uh, Jules Gugno, maybe Gugno can find a way past, and maybe yeah. Matt Campbell can take advantage of that as well. So we're going to see now uh, whether whether you know, that'll happen and whether Gugno will make, try to make a move on Jordan Taylor as well. Well, the Mercedes looks the sharper of the two cars between it and the Porsche, I have to say. So you need something sharp to prize the, the opening on Jordan Taylor. And Jules Gounon, it's not a case of him feeling more up for it. It's just that his car seems to be well and truly in the sweet spot right now. And uh, no longer does it have a Porsche to try and find its way around. The attack begins on the back of the big American muscle car of Jordan Taylor swinging through the double right-hander at Big Bend and the Corvette's tyres might be struggling a little bit as well because Jordan had to have two goes at the left-hander there the car just briefly unsettled on the crown of the road so the Corvette now in super defensive mode visibly it looks like these two are actually closing in on Jack Hawksworth though even though they've been battling amongst themselves does that gap come down or is it, is it just my eyes Jeremy? It's your eyes. Okay. I thought the same thing, but it's been 1.6 seconds now for the last ooh, last 10 laps, in fact. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, and, and the, yeah, they're all turning identical laps, 53 ones or thereabouts. Uh, uh, Ross Gunn, however, has, he's closed the gap just a little bit to the uh, to the uh, the FAF Motorsports car. But that's probably more as a result of the FAF car being closed, uh, being uh, overtaken by. Uh, Jules Gugnon. So really, the top four cars are running almost identical lap times and have been doing since their pit stops. Uh, how long ago was it? 20 minutes or so ago. Mercedes happier. But mean, meantime, Aaron Tielitz is definitely inching a little bit closer, a tenth of a second or two per lap, maybe a little bit more than that on occasion, toward Madison Snow in the leading car number one. Well, through the last split, the gap from Snow to Tielitz exactly two seconds to the thousandth so Tielitz uh, certainly whittling away at that lead to Madison Snow that's a BMW versus Lexus battle there is a second pit stop for the number 25 BMW and what did we say they would be pitting they would be trying to pit with an hour and six to go so this is earlier than we would have expected Shay Adam yeah, it is, Johnny, and they are doing fuel and all four tires. So this is more of a stop. Oh, they had to put the car back up on the air jack before they allowed John Edwards to go. So again, their bad day continues. And John now leaving the pit lane, but I think the air hose might have been trapped underneath the car, and that's why they had to put it back up on the jack so that they wouldn't run it over. Now John releases the pit speed limiter and goes back out on the circuit, but this is a race that they already want to forget just seems to be at the rate of diminishing returns Jeremy one thing goes wrong and only a, a minor thing with the ride height but then they've been chasing their tail the big incident with Cooper McNeil which resulted in a spin for Co uh, Conor Di Filippi on the main straight and now an earlier pit stop than we all expected and uh, one or two clumsy moments within that too horrible luck once again
Yeah, disastrous day for uh, the BMW M Team RLL. Nothing is going right for them and continues to be the case for that team. But uh, meanwhile, that gap between first and second remains at 1.6 seconds. <laughs> and uh, Ross Gunn just, yeah, just fractionally close to 9.4 back to Ross Gunn. Uh, and that gap between Madison Snow and Aaron Tillis, that seems to have uh, settled down now to just around about two seconds. Uh, between the two GTD leaders, number one ahead of number 12. And the John Edwards BMW as it rejoins. Yes, it's uh, done one more pit stop than everybody else, but is uh, back off the lead lap now compared to Jack Hawksworth. Uh, Matty Campbell two and a half away from the race leading Vassa Sullivan Lexus, which piles its way into Big Bend at top speed, but the speed is scrubbed sufficiently by the Yorkshireman. Heading now through the left-hander and the right-hander climbing the hill. Well, along No Name straight, first of all, and then leaping on the brakes in a moment or two for that uh, tricky chicane at the end of No Name straight. Now, a moment or two ago, this was when the Mercedes was behind the Porsche. They haven't changed again, have they? No. So the move was made on No Name Straight and absolutely no fight held up by Matty Campbell. That was a concession of road position rather than position itself, uh, uh, timing screen position, because Matt Campbell, his uh, place did not alter because of that. But just more of a, perhaps a buzz in the ear from the team, from FAF Motorsports to say it's wise to give Jules on the space to get through because he might be better at prizing this opening on the Corvette up front that runs second. And now actually only 1.3 behind Jack Hawksworth. So it really has come down on this lap, Jeremy Shaw. Yeah, it has, hasn't it? And uh, I've been watching the lap times for the race today. Incredibly consistent, uh, around about 53.1 for Jack Hawksworth. You know, 53.0, 53.1, basically every one of the last 20 laps since his pit stop. Last time around was a 53.2. Previous lap action was a 53.4, so we're certainly going to keep, keep an eye on that, uh, and that's uh, kind of similar to what we saw in the first stint of the race, where our, the race leader, uh, Matt Campbell, was turning very, very consistent laps uh, at uh, about near, again, low 53s, 53 two or three, so Hawks are going a little bit quicker than the opening stint, but then all of a sudden it fell down to 53 fives and then 53 eights uh, after about 25 laps or so of his stint. Uh, Jack Hawks has made his pit stop after, how many laps? Uh, 33 laps, so he's been out a lot longer than that and turning still good laps at the moment in that leading car, but the gap is coming down to the Corvette through the chicane threads Mike Skeen and his number 32 uh, team caught off Motorsports Mercedes AMG Stephen McAleer started that car number 32 running in ninth place right now but uh, Philip Ellis has kind of checked out from this vicinity we did not too long ago have nose to tail AMGs running in eighth and ninth but the 57 car scampering away and trying to hunt down the heart of racing team Aston, now driven by Belgian maestro Maxime Martin. So Martin taking over from Roman De Angelis in the first pit stop for the GT Daytona hard of racing Aston. Remember that team have a car in each of the classes. And the second car, actually the better placed in the order, is the one piloted by Ross Gunn, running in fourth position, car 23. And uh, that gap to the lead has come down again, down to 10 seconds now, separating Ross Gunn to Jack Hawksworth. Fastest lap still in the hands of Jules Gounon, despite the fact that he is in the uh, theoretically slower of the two classes, but uh, they're all identical no, no, regulation no, cars, so you can't really say that, can you, Jeremy? No. Well, no, no, theoretically not, because uh, they, they, they are identical specifications of cars, so you know, there, there is no difference at all in specifications of GTD or GTD Pro. It is simply that driver rating or, or uh, you know, the class they choose to enter, because Cooper McNeil is eligible for either class. He's opted to run in GTE Pro through the opening part of the season, but now has uh, gone back to GTD regular because he is not a uh, platinum or platinum rated driver. 
and uh, to back that point up, qualifying yesterday, you could have taken a GT Daytona car to the pole if you were quick enough. We have seen GT Daytona cars out-qualify GT Daytona Pro machines this season, and there is then no separation of the field. Um, and that's the, the beauty of having uh, a single class, if you like, spread across different driver combinations. The all-pro outfits of uh, 14 Lexus, from Vassa Sullivan, the three Corvette, the number nine FAF Motorsports Porsche, the 23 Aston Martin for Heart of Racing Team and the 25 Team RLL BMW. And everybody else has a pro and a non-pro, but uh, depending on who is in the car at any one point, they are all on a level playing field. An hour and a half just over, still to go here on RS2 IMSA Radio, round nine of the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship. It's GT Daytona only, with the pro and the non-pro, the pro and the regular classes uh, having the spotlight shone upon them. And uh, the FCP Euro Northeast Grand Prix for 2022, around this one and a half mile bullring Lime Rock Park, and fabulous to be back in this part of Connecticut once again in 2022. Heading underneath the Lime Rock Park bridge now is Jules Gounon's number 79 Mercedes. It's the 25 BMW a little tardy again. It's working yeah. its way through. It is slow, isn't it, Jeremy? And uh, Shay Adam reporting potential problems for this car. We've already had a misfire for the Turner Motorsport version of their M4. And this car looking very slow and possibly engine note off again as it reaches the chicane, Jeremy Shaw. Yeah, it looks like he was well off the pace there. He's keeping to the inside of the track, coming to West Bend as well. So uh, there's, uh, there's clearly problems on number 25 car. It just goes from bad to worse. I'm sure that car will be coming into the pits, most likely to retire this time around. Really unfortunate. He's going to try and, yeah, he does a good job there to keep out of the way as the other cars come around the outside of it into the downhill turn. And he makes that right hand turn onto the pit lane. So this is the, the brand new GT3 car offered by BMW to customer teams. It has a twin scroll turbo, three litre to straight six engine, and clearly Turner Motorsport are struggling it with a misfire in for their car. And it looks like the focus for Team RLL is the engine bay, Shay Adam. Torches, flashlights being shone deep oh. inside there. Uh, Johnny, I'm having flashes of what I saw earlier, which is uh, engineers looking in the left side or the driver's side of the engine bay. They're telling John to fire the car up. They want to get a look at the engine running with the hood off to see if there's any visible sign of anything wrong. They just told him to cut the engine off again after shaking their head as if to indicate that they couldn't see anything. But there is a lot of white smoke coming out from the water container area and now being told, nope, don't open that. This is not a good day for BMW. Uh, it's going to make me nervous the rest of this race for Paul Miller. On the other hand, so many of you here at the track having an absolute whale of a time. Thank you for your waves and screams towards the big screen up there on the banking. There's hardly a place to, uh, to set up camp for the rest of this race. You had to be here nice and early in the weekend, Jeremy, to pick those locations for spectating. It's always been well subscribed here at Lime Rock Park. Yeah, always a fun place to come, it really is. And there's so much history at this racetrack as well. Uh, I'm indebted to my, my good friend, uh, uh, Greg Ricks, who's he, been the track announcer here for many, many years. He was telling me the story about the uh, the, the the little Le Mans that took place uh, here at Lime Rock Park back in 1957, it was, the first of that uh, the races. It was, for, it was for imported sedans, because there wasn't really you know, there wasn't really a, a, an import market in those days for, for sports cars. Well, there was for sports cars, but not for racing necessarily, for, for sedan cars, improved sedans, if you like. And effectively, those cars are what have kind of been transformed now into the Michelin Pilot Challenge that was racing uh, earlier on today. So, uh, yeah, a little bit of history there, and, and of which is so much of this glorious little track in rural Connecticut. But look, uh, we've got this battle for the lead. It's, it's, it's on again now because Jack Hawks with lead is, is down to around about a second. It, for many, many laps, it was about one and a half seconds. It's now just about a second that he has in hand. Meanwhile, Madison Snow seems to weather that storm in terms of the approaching caliber 12 for Aaron Teal. It's that gap kind of came down from uh, about four seconds down to two but it's now extended out to two and a half so he's weathered that storm madison snow turning some really good lap times still 
in that number one Paul Miller Racing BMW. Yep, I remember not too long ago the gap back to Aaron Tielitz was 2.000 seconds. Well, it's almost 2.5 now between Madison Snow and the chasing Lexus car number 12. But will there be an element of worry, perhaps, at Paul Miller Racing, know that, knowing that there were three BMWs that started this race? Two of them have hit mechanical dramas, and they are now the lone uh, car for the Bavarian brand with the roundel on the nose. Still sounding very sweet indeed, though, the uh, straight six as the 25 car is going to join its sister, if you like, the 96 from Turner Motorsport behind the wall. So car 25 needing more treatment and more personnel to descend upon it. There's a little bit of damage on the rear left, I notice, of the Aston Martin of Maxime Martin. That's only trim that is peeling away. In fact, I think it's a bit of the wrap which is leaving from the rear uh, wheel arch of car 27. That won't be sh slowing Maxime Martin down at all. He is, though, well, staring at something like a 15-second gap to the race leaders, Jeremy. Corvette in the pits, uh, driver change here. Uh, Jordan Taylor hands out that car over to Antonio Garcia. Let's get to Shea for the update. It's fuel and four new Michelin tires for the King of Spain as he drops off the airjacks, just waiting on fuel. Another perfect stop from Corvette Racing. Yeah, but a bit earlier than I would have anticipated, Shea, with an hour and 14 minutes of, well, basically an hour and, an hour, excuse me, an hour and 24 remaining in this race. That's uh, a, a lot earlier than I would have anticipated. Was there a problem there for the number three team? I'm sure Shea will dive in to find out, but you cannot make the finish on a tank of fuel uh, with an hour and 24 to go. These uh, GT3 cars are very good on the fuel consumption, but I think 65 and 70 minutes at the push is your absolute limit. If it stays green, but it's a weird old strategy for Corvette to be you know, hoping for a yellow. Uh, in the closing stint, effectively. So, uh, Shay, you, you, I think you had a word or maybe had had some questions answered earlier on in the race. What do we know about Corvette and was that a, a stop out of sequence? Well, I was stalking the GTV Pro teams, looking to see who was going to be making their driver changes and when. For about the last 15 minutes, they've had Antonio Garcia fully helmeted, suited, booted, and ready to go. I think, honestly, Jeremy, at this point, Antonio just wanted to drive. But I will ask the question of Corvette Racing. Yeah, I mean, you know, the drive's always going to be ready to go. Uh, but um, I, I would have thought, uh, you know, they made their, their first pit stop uh, 40 minutes into the race. Um, no, it wasn't that much, was it? Um, well, the Corvette and the Lexus pitted together, didn't they? Because Jordan Taylor rejoined and he was right alongside uh, Hawksworth and had to get the place back up again. So it was the same kind of time. Um, but it was, it was before the Porsche uh, of uh, Matty Campbell. But again, it was, but it was after, well after the 25 BMW, when we thought they were really stretching things as far as fuel consumption was concerned. So it might have been about the 40-minute marker. A 20-minute marker. It was. 20-minute marker, uh, big part. Yeah. Right. So which, 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 and it is, it's, oh, yeah, I'm curious. I'll let, Anyhow, uh, I'll let Jeremy the, uh, dive within the stats. Go on. Yes, <laughs> another point to make. No, I was going to, I was going to, I was going to say there that. Uh, uh, Jack Hawks with just incredibly consistent lap times, uh, 53 point uh, or 2.47.5151535355255 his last uh, seven or eight laps. So incredibly consistent at the front of that field. And Matty Campbell, uh, he's still though only about a second behind. One second and one thousandth to be exact through the last split between Jack Hawksworth in the Lexus and Matty Campbell in the number nine plaid liveried Porsche from Faf. This is IMSA Radio, uh, the RS2, part of the Radio Show Limited network of channels, and we'll head to the pits to maybe get an answer on that, in inverted commas, early pit stop for Corvette. Here's Jordan Taylor with Shay. Jordan Taylor fresh out of the number three Corvette and I say fresh because you look like you're hardly were even working but the battling out there was fast and furious how good is your crew to get you out ahead of everybody else and get you a good chance of fighting though yeah I think you know is it going to be a two stop or three stop and one you pit uh, unfortunately we need clean air with this strategy it looks like we came out in traffic so hopefully we'll be able to clear them pretty quickly on the fresh tires but yeah the car is pretty good the first thing we were showing with understeer I think sitting behind the Aston Second stint, the car was a bit better um, following the Lexus, so 
hopefully we can get some clean air, make this strategy work, but I think it's going to come down to that last stop and how long everyone has to sit in the pits for fuel. So was this stop just now a little bit earlier than anticipated? Uh, I mean, it depends on how you break up the race. It could be, you know, a couple 70 lap runs, a couple 45 to 50 lap runs. So I think everyone's playing that a little bit differently. We saw that with the nine car at the beginning, uh, how late they stayed out. So we jumped them, but then they have a fueling advantage. So I need to check the lap time now to see kind of where it balances out with, our, with the traffic that we're in. But uh, yeah, fresh tires around here is usually pretty nice to feel for a couple of laps. You and Antonio are one of only two cars in the field where both drivers have previously won at Lime Rock. How good does it feel to be battling for another win here? Yeah, it's good. I mean, it's been a rough couple races for us since Long Beach. We haven't really been battling at the front. Um, so it's been a bit frustrating to be kind of mired in the pack. So it's nice to be in the battle, in the fight, um, not just on track, but able to play strategy calls that keep you in the mix. So it's definitely nice to see the Corvette back, back up front where it belongs. Yeah, agree. Good luck the rest of the way. Thank you. Well, we've already had one hand yeah. off the steering wheel for Tonio Garcia saying, I need to get through this traffic. The problem is, Jeremy, the man that stands in his way now is the 79 driven by Jules Gounon. He's rapid. He is indeed. And uh, yeah, he's not going to give up that place lightly. And um, yeah, that's, uh, that's exactly what the Corvette team didn't need. And, you know, I think the, these pit stops, making a three pit stop race, I think that's more tyre dependent rather than fuel dependent. So they, they don't want to stretch that fuel load to the full hour, I am I am presuming, because I think they could, certainly can, I think they're capable of running a good bit longer than they have done so far. Race leader in GT Daytona is in. It's a driver change, Shay, and what else for the number one car? Fuel, tires, and Brian Sellers for the number one Paul Miller Racing BMW with more than 200 guests on site for this weekend's race. Paul Miller very much in anticipating eagerly the results of this race. Very quick stop, brilliantly done by Paul Miller's crew. And away goes Brian as 23 seconds stationary. When you consider a full fuel load is 40 seconds in the GTD class, that's brilliant work. We have to turn the number one Paul Miller Racing BMW around very swiftly indeed. The name Snow will turn to Sellers on our timing screen and we'll get to see in a moment or two where that number one car feeds back into the mixture. But again, Jeremy, with an hour and well, just under 20 minutes to go, they're not going to be able to make the finish on this single tank of fuel. So again, are they concerned about the amount of tyre wear around this place? It's got to be that because I'm sure they can run more than 45 minutes uh, on a on a tank of fuel. So uh, that's uh, clearly a concern. I mean, lap times certainly weren't dropping off uh, very much. So it's uh, it's interesting to, to note that. Uh, I mean, you know, they're going a second slower than they can do on fresh tyres, uh, and that is the key thing. But for how long can you turn that that sort of pace? Jack Hawks is now consistently 53.5, 53.6 lap after lap after lap but he's got his hands full now as Hawks with with Maddie Campbell with uh, Jaminet having come and made a pit stop a couple of laps ago in the Mercedes and also the Corvette Ditto now Campbell has a clear shot at Jack Hawksworth and he is closed in very rapidly he's now putting Hawksworth under a lot of pressure in the lead of this race with 91 laps completed and we know that the Porsche is very, very good on its toes when the tank is getting light. It won't be quite as light as the Lexus in front because the Lexus pitted earlier than the Porsche, which took on uh, more fuel, and that's what lo lost it road position. But yes, that gap from a second is now down to just under three tenths as they cross the line and head into Big Bend for the 93rd time. Let's give you the order then, with an hour and 17 still to go. Jack Hawksworth leads in the number 14, Vassar Sullivan, Lexus with the red door mirrors. Right on his boot lid is Matty Campbell as the Corvette goes straight on at the chicane. So heading through the uphill, it's going to have to thread its way through the tyre bales there and rejoin the racetrack. And that car's crapping, I think. It's had some sort of contact or maybe a failure, but it looks like the car is trying to jettison Antonio Garcia off the road. Let's just see whether it gets back up to speed sufficiently. That might just be the way that the cars are set up. We've already detailed that this place is... No, it's definitely steering from the rear and suspension failure on the rear right, maybe too much curb hopping. And Shay Adam is looking out for Tonio Garcia. He's not long been in the saddle of this car, Shay, and already back to you. No, he hasn't, and the right rear tire is actually facing out, so the camber pointing 
away from the car. That is not how it's supposed to be. I'm just trapped a little bit by the pit stop in the number 27 heart of racing ass Martin Maxime Martin coming in. The old tires losing a lot of time on the car being left upon the air drags. About two seconds lost as to there. Let's see where he cycles back out, but I'll head up to the Corvette. I don't think that was just a tire. I think it was suspension, but I'll be able to tell you more in a minute. Yeah, they don't want to put a rear right on that until everything is checked, but I, I sense that either suspension or hub failure on the number three Corvette and uh, Corvette mechanics now descending on it, Jeremy, uh, trying to check the structural integrity of uh, the bits beneath the wheel arch there. Yeah, absolutely right. Uh, so really unfortunate uh, for that uh, for that team, and uh, this is going to be a long pit stop for that uh, number three car. Let's have a look. See, did he make contact with Jules Gugnon in the number 79 Miss WeatherTech car? And this is my fear. The Aston Martin of 27 was there as well, but it was a hip and shoulder. It was wheel arch to wheel arch of Jules Gugnon and the Corvette of Tonio Garcia. That's what's bent the suspension strut. Just at the Spaniard eagerly trying to get by this GT Daytona traffic. And as Jordan Taylor had already explained to us, there wasn't a moment to lose on this fresh rubber because the peak performance of a brand new Michelin tire doesn't last forever. So he was trying to force the issue, I think it's fair to say, Garcia, and then bang, something completely broke on the rear right corner, meaning that uh, the Corvette could not make the chicane at turns five and six. That's exactly right, Johnny Palmer, and really unfortunate for that team, just sort of incidental contact there. It certainly wasn't a heavy hit. It must have just caught it just, just at the wrong angle. So uh, real great shave. That's the end of the Corvette in terms of challenging for positions here. Uh, meanwhile, Ross Gunn is definitely inching, inching closer to the leader. Six and a half seconds now, the gap from uh, second to third. At 23, at number, Aston Mar number 23, Aston Martin, Ross Gunn at the wheel. Uh, he is, uh, yeah, regularly a, a tenth or two or, or three even quicker at this last last four or five laps than the two leaders. But uh, Maddie Campbell still unable to find a way past Jack Hawksworth. The, uh, the clink of metal tools being picked up and dropped into the toolbox. The right size needs to, of course, to be selected. And then this is just torturous work because... They can see the other side of the wall, laps disappearing in this motor race. They're already three down from Jack Hawksworth and unfortunately falling further and further behind. It's a sorry state of affairs, but I suppose the team at Corvette needed to take risks to make sure that they were in the game come the end of this two hour and 40 minute race. But those are the breaks sometimes. And we already knew something was up with the car. It was slowing. I wonder whether it might just be tire. Uh, a tyre that had let go, but then uh, realised that the steering was not only happening on the front wheels, but also on the rear right as well. And Antonio Garcia doing a very good job, actually, to get into pit lane. It's a narrow pit lane here. You have to thread your way through uh, some tight and twisty walls, and he did so with three wheels steering on the wagon. An hour and 13 to go in the 2022 edition of the SCP Euro Northeast Grand Prix, live here from Lime Rock Park, and it's car 14 at Jack Hawksworth, the Vassar Sullivan Lexus that leads on lap 98 from Matty Campbell. 0.5 of a second adrift in the FAF Motorsport Porsche. Then Ross Gunn in the number 23 Aston Martin from Heart of Racing Team. Fourth position overall is the number 12 Aaron Tielitz driven Vassa Sullivan Lexus. From Philip Ellis, who's been moving up the order, car 57 now to second. Similar Mercedes AMG for Mike Skeen is now third. That is for the team caught off motorsports crew. Then it is the 39 Lamborghini of Jeff Westfall for Carbon with Peregrine Racing. And in fifth position in GT Daytona, Jan Halen in the right motorsports Porsche car number 16. That was your VP Racing Fuels in race update. And Jeremy, that rise up the order from Philip Ellis and Mike Skeen for that, for that fact it has been impressive in the two Mercedes, although there have been pit stoppers to take into account. Yeah, they have, and uh, yeah, that, that's the Brian Sellers car, that's made an extra pit stop. Here comes the Aston Martin now, car number 23 onto pit lane as well, out of third position. And he'd been curiously should come in, choose to come in now with 72 minutes remaining in this race uh, because uh, he, was, he was gaining on the leaders by... Uh, by, well, three or four tenths of a second lap each of the last four or five laps. Amazingly, the Corvette is away already and back into the race. It has lost five laps 
to Jack Hawksworth, but great work nevertheless from Pratt and Miller and those associated with Corvette Racing. Pit stop for car 23, though, as Jeremy mentions, and Shay Adam was watching that. Corvette actually scared me because I was watching the Aston Martin and all of a sudden the Corvette roared back into life. But it was a very smooth stop from the heart of racing. 32 seconds worth of fuel. Ross Gunn out to Alex Riberis into the end of this one. And that has actually triggered a pit stop from the number 12 Lexus and possibly even the 14 Lexus. The 12 is definitely going to be coming in with Aaron Tealeth fuel and what looks like four tires. I'm going to keep a sharp eye on that, though, because they might just go for two. And then the 14 Lexus will be doing fuel and Ben Barnicat taking over that car. So Alex Ribiras in the 23 rejoining the race. It leaves for the time being the top two, but they are absolutely together. And Matty Campbell might have got the inside line here on Jack Hawksworth for the overall lead of the race. He needs to be later on the brakes into the right-hander at turn six at West Bend. And that was superb driving because he'd lined the Lexus up into the flick flack at the chicane, just got Hawksworth off his stride. And that was the only chance that Matty Campbell required. Superb overtake for the lead, Jeremy. Yeah, lap 100 of this race then, and uh, that was a great move going into West Bend by Matty Campbell. Clearly, he's got a really, uh, a really good car here at the moment, uh, but he took advantage of the slightest of slips by the Lexus, and through he goes. And that's the one we've been waiting for, because I do sense now that the number nine car from Canadian team Faf Motorsports will be able to open up a fairly significant gap now. Jack, Jack Hawksworth's car will need to pit earlier than Matty Campbell. And speaking of pit stops for Lexuses, here is the sister car of Valen Aaron Tielitz from the lead of the class show. Fuel and four tires for this number 12 Lexus, but a slow front left tire change as the wheel nut actually got lost for the mechanic. Let's see, putting on the front right now. The fuel nozzle is still attached, so no time being lost. Now we can drop the car off the air jacks. Still putting in fuel, so again, no time lost from the errant wheel nut. That is good news for Lexus. They have not done a windshield tear off nor a drink bottle change for Aaron Tielitz as he too leaves after 33 seconds in the box. So very good fuel economy from these big engine cars such as the Aston and the Lexus. Yeah, five litre V8 in the nose of this RCF, naturally aspirated, sounds glorious as it picks up the pace again into Big Bend and has lost the lead, of course. That is now in the hands of Philip Ellis in the 57 Mercedes from Wynward Racing. Russell Ward started that car from a 10th position on the grid, a 51.5 Russell Ward was able to put in in qualifying yesterday. And Philip Ellis, the uh, uh, German-born British driver, or German-based these days at least, is back in the pit lane, I noticed. So car 57, I think Shea being offered some sticker tyres here. Yep, and those still have the stickers on them. So Phil Ellis staying aboard. Uh, they do give him a windshield tear off. Oh, he's a lucky boy in this stage of the race. Waiting on fuel. It was a good stop by Winward. Fuel nozzle comes out. Big splash of fuel as that releases. And away it goes Philip. Uh, the other team that has started to prepare a little bit. It's toward pit out, but no, it's not Faf. It's Gilbert, uh, Team Concord. Their Mercedes, they're expecting the men to give Mike Skeen a splash of fuel as well. Well, that was absolutely brimmed, as you call, Che, in the pit. So they are hoping that they're going to be good to the finish now. Just inside 70 minutes to go, Jeremy. If it does stay green, there might be the need to lift and coast here and there. 65 and 70 minutes at a push, so they should be OK to the finish now. Yeah, if, uh, if they, they can make the tyres last that long. Well, true. You know, it's, it's going to be really interesting to see now how this plays out towards the end of this race. Jack Hawksworth now, I think. Ducky onto pit lane, 103 laps completed by the, uh, by the leader. Meanwhile, as we described at the time, a really good shape up for the overtake on Jack Hawksworth from Matty Campbell. Hawksworth tried to get the Lexus across the road to defend, but the, the run was too good from the man from Queensland and uh, squeezing up the inside there for Campbell, who did such a good job in qualifying yesterday with that 51 flat, 51.079 to be exact, only 18 thousandths of a second quicker than others. Uh, quicker than that, in fact, the Jack Hawksworth Lexus, which is in pit road. So Vassar Sullivan choosing to pit their cars, what, about a lap apart, Shea Adam? Yeah, they did. 
Jack Hawksworth got out. He did flip the throttle when he got out, but the car was not engaged in gear, so no wheel spin while on the jack. And it was fuel and four tires for Ben Barnicut, who now pilots that car. So first action for Ben in the race, and he has dropped, well, it's unfair to say at the moment, will allow them to go through the next split to get a true distance between Matt Campbell and Ben Barnacode, it's hovering around 13 or 14 seconds. Campbell up the hill, out of the chicane and onto the back straight, that short blast of the throttle before, oh, and way off the kerb, coming through West Bend there, kicking up an awful lot of dust, but he controlled that well, an indication of quite hard, Matt, how hard Matt Campbell is pushing right now. Yes, he's into that clear air, but he knows how valuable this track space is, Jeremy Shaw, pushing probably to something like qualifying pace right now. Yeah, really, really pushing hard. 53.5 uh, was his previous lap. Uh, he did turn a 53-1 about three laps ago, but that uh, it, that took a lot out of his tyres, I think, the 53-5, uh, then a 53-4, uh, and then a 53-9 this time around with that off there uh, at the exit of, of West Bend. So, you know, he's, he's got an hour and five minutes uh, to go, uh, but he still, of course, has to make that driver change because Matty Campbell has been in from the start. Yeah, and Mathieu Jaminet has to do a minimum of 45 minutes, so that means has to be in the next 20 that we see the FAF Motorsport car on pit road but they're looking to extend that in fact it's going to be in now I was about to say extend the fuel window as much as possible but for Mathieu Jaminet to get as much seat time as possible too the car will pit on the nosy with an hour and five minutes still to go on the clock uh, I'm quite sure FAF Motorsport are fully expecting this car on pit road they're all set up right at the end of pit lane Shay Adam Yes, they are, and they were fully expecting the car to come in. Matthew Jaminet, who put his helmet on about 20 minutes ago, has been waiting for the opportunity to get to drive this car in the race. So his teammate who stuck the car on pole, taking the attention away from his previous two pole positions. No, these two Matthews share very well together. 21 seconds worth of fuel so far. Ooh, windshield tear off for Jaminet as the fueler is still attached on the front. That was the sound of the Carbon Lamborghini getting going again. And Beating out half is Team Gilbert Motorsport. That was brilliant. Team Cothworth, excuse me, for Mike Skeen. They did fuel tires and got out ahead of the bright red Porsche. And then came the Lamborghini, who also did fuel and tires for Jeff Westfall. Yeah, and uh, Jaminet had to be well aware of what Team Courtoff were doing there with their rejoining Mercedes so as not to pull across the nose of it. It was the Mercedes that had right of way, being in the fast lane quicker than the plaid Porsche and at the number nine will rejoin, hanging on to the race lead. The right Motorsports Porsche is now at the second overall by virtue of the fact that it owes us a pit stop, but it's effectively a Porsche 1-2 now, with uh, the first car being a Daytona Pro Machine and the one behind a Daytona GT Daytona standard driver lineup. But Jan Halen will be due in relatively shortly. And if uh, cars uh, or other teams are back timing their uh, routes to the flag by fuel amounts, then this is a good time to pit. But as Jeremy has raised the point several times, will the tyres do that sort of distance? Uh, calling back to one of our Porsche keys to the race, though, FAF Motorsport well aware of drive times and not falling foul of the clock, getting Mathieu Jaminet in for his minimum of 45 minutes. He'll actually do 65 minutes there or thereabouts. And as expected, I did say that the 16 right Motorsport Porsche owed us a stop. It's in now, Shay. You made it happen, Johnny. I think they heard you and went, oh, yeah, we should bring Jan Halen in. Uh, fuel and four sticker tires for Jan Halen. Well, I should say lightly scuffed, actually, because he did that work in morning warm-up. They were stickers at the start of the day. He's revving the engine. The fueler is still there, still plugged in. Now, oh, that was grim fill, too, for Jan Halen. As he does a nice big burnout. Just a quick note, I think the 27 Heart of Racing is already in fuel save mode for that Aston Martin because every time he reaches about the six marker, he's already lifted and he doesn't break until he gets to the two. In also for their final stop is Paul Miller Racing in their, in their BMW. They came in from the lead. 
They are doing fuel and four tires for Brian Sellers. Now, this is going to have to be a very quick stop, given that they didn't put that much fuel in the last time. Let's see. These are sticker Michelins. Fueling is done. Tire change is almost done. Car drops off the air jacks. Brian tries to do a burnout, but the new M4 doesn't really like those. It doesn't really allow them to happen. So now I think we've seen the last of our final pit stoppers for this race, haven't we? lots of different ways to, to cut this cake. The two hours and 40 minutes that we started with, you could do it with two stops. Um, you could do it with three stops. It depends on how much you want to push the tires, but on straight fuel loads, uh, it could have been done on three individual stints because these cars, as mentioned, can do an hour quite comfortably. But interesting that Shea reports that Alex Riberas, the 28-year-old from Barcelona, driving the number 23 Aston Martin from Heart of Racing Team, second on the road, is just starting to lift a little earlier than we would have expected into Big Bend to try and conserve some fuel this far from the race. 27, beg your pardon, so it's actually Maxime Martin in the Heart of Racing car that Shea had heard doing that. Alex Riberas, therefore, is fully on it, running in second place. And not giving up on the overall lead quite yet, although, Jeremy, seven, a little over seven seconds stand between Alex Riberas and the race leader. And he lost a lot of time on that last lap. He lost about one and three quarter seconds, did Riberas, to Jaminé, of course, on a fresh set of tyres in that Faf Motorsports car. The question now is, uh, you know, can uh, Jaminé, does he want to go to the end from here? I presume he does. Uh, but it's, it's, it's interesting to me, I mean, you know, Later part of the race, more rubber laid down. It's less tyre wear than would be the case earlier in the race. But uh, this is the first time we've seen, potentially, teams stretching it to a full hour because uh, their stops have been much uh, more frequent than that up until this stage in the race. So really interesting to see how the different strategies are, are, are going to play out in the closing stages of this race. Yeah, so effectively, pretty much all the teams have now back-timed it so that they get a full fuel run in the closing stages. But will the tyres like that? Yes, the track has become more grippy through the course of this race so far, but temperature still pretty high. Ambient, well, it was 81. It's crept up to 83 Fahrenheit now. 28, if you prefer the alternative measurement scale. Humidity's dropped marginally and a very light wind as well at just six miles per hour. Uh, but uh, some cloud cover, which will help the engines and certainly help the tyres a touch too. But definitely some management of the four black things on each of the corners of these cars, provided by Michelin, of course, once again this year for the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship. It's the 2022 edition of the S FCP Euro Northeast Grand Prix, live here from Lime Rock Park. Jeremy Shaw and Johnny Palmer in the Haggerty Global Broadcast Centre. And you can get in touch here on RS2 IMSA Radio uh, using the uh, Twitter handle IMSA Radio, at IMSA Radio. And uh, now is about the right sort of time, actually, to welcome your questions for our Michelin post-race tech once the chequered flag has been shown to all our runners and riders. Hashtag Michelin PRT for those. Inside the final hour, and Mathieu Jaminet, who's only recently taken over the number nine FAF Motorsports Porsche from Matty Campbell, leading the way, but with a bit of traffic to deal with up ahead of him. Some GT Daytona cars that, uh, well, is he going to ne necessarily be quicker than those, or will they just be a speck on the horizon, not really getting any bigger or smaller? Heading through the downhill now, he has a 6.4 second lead over Alex Riberas, so that has come down a touch back to the Spaniard in second. Ben Barnacote in third in the number 14 Vassa Sullivan Lexus, a car that was started by Jack Hawksworth, and then the second of the cars from that team, leading GT Daytona, Aaron Tielitz, car 12, is fourth on the road in turn ahead of car 27, which is the heart of racing team Aston Martin for Maxime Martin. That's right, and uh, Aaron Tielitz in that GTD leading Lexus car number 12. He's only eight seconds behind his teammate, uh, Ben Barnick, of course, running in the pro class. So it's been a really good run by that number 12 team. Uh, so Aaron Tielitz leads by about 11 seconds now over Maxime Martin, who has got his mirrors full of Jules Gunion. Remember that name uh, up into uh, the 
sixth position Abbott, challenging Martin for second position in GTD, then another gap back to Phil Ellis, and then another lap, gap, lap, uh, gap back to Brian Sellers, who of course has made one more pit stop than the other contenders in GTD. Yeah, and this is what I mean about uh, several different ways to, to skin a cat, if you like. There are different ways to approach this race, and they will have been planned out in the days leading into this race, possibly from a few weeks out, in fact, because uh, you can revisit previous affairs, not necessarily last year's version of this race, because it only ran to about 90 minutes because of poor weather. But um, always tricky to be in a good position around here. You need a fast race car, but you also need road position uh, and to, to think about the fuel consumption and the tire wear of these cars as Mathieu Jamade exits the downhill and streams across the line once again. That Mercedes in front, not really getting much closer. And further behind him is the Lamborghini of Jeff Westphal, running 10th overall for Carbon with Peregrine Racing. As we can head to the pits once again to get this update from Shay Adam. With Roman DeAngelis. Roman, you said that you don't like watching after you've gotten out of the car. Heart of Racing running in second last year with the win. It's got to be an extra nerve-wracking track, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, the beginning of the race was quite hard to read with uh, everyone kind of doing different strategies, um, people pitting to go to the end and going short and all kinds of different different strategy calls. So I think now it's pretty much settled out and everyone possibly will be able to make it to the end. Um, we took a pretty big gamble pitting early um, and, and trying to see how long we can run on fuel here. So um, yeah, really good race so far. We're in a pretty good position. So hopefully we can get some good points. Is this a weird experience for you, standing here watching the TV screens with Ian James and Ross Gunn, the two guys that you shared a car with last year? Yeah, I know. Usually, I'm I'm in the car, out of the car when they are in the car. So, um, yeah, no, it's it's a really good team. It's awesome having two cars. The pro car also in second. So, um, looking for some some more podiums for the, the Heart of Racing this weekend. Good luck for both teams. Thank you. Well, one is running second, and the other one is running second within the classes. So uh, they're in a great spot where they would love to just creep one place further up to be top step of the podium, Jeremy Shaw. Yeah, wouldn't they just? It's been a great few weeks for, for this team. The uh, number uh, 27 car has won the GTD class each of the last uh, two races, and the uh, the pro car has had a win and a third in the last two races. Now, the most recent race, a couple of weeks ago at Canadian Time Motorsport Park, that was not a round of the overall championship for GTD regular. Uh, but it was around of the Sprint Cup series, so it got got a little bit closer. But it's been a really rich vein of a vein of form for all this hard racing Aston Martin team after a pretty tricky first few races of the season. So with it not being a kind of regular round, you mean it delivers fewer points because it's part of the Sprint Championship? Correct. It, it delivers no no points towards the overall season championship. That's correct. Yeah. So this race uh, far the more important of the two, therefore. And, uh, well, the points haul for both cars individually, mightily impressive so far, but Ben Barnacote will want to change that. He is now closing in on Alex Riberas. So this is the second and third place scrap heading underneath the Haggerty Bridge and about to complete yet another lap. That will be 118 completed for these cars. We have been fully green to this point with 53 minutes remaining on the clock. And record distance is, well, somewhere around the late 170s, I think I'm right in saying, Jeremy Shaw. There is a chance. Yeah, I think it was 178 in, in 2019 when okay. the FAF team also won, by the way. That was the, the team's first full season in the Interweb Export Star Championship. And probably was the first win, actually. So 178 is the marker to beat on the distance record. This is uh, with a new class of car, of course, GT Daytona Pro, but would still very much count. And uh, so that would be a record that stands from GT LM days. Now there's something trailing from the front left corner of the WeatherTech Racing Mercedes, I noticed. Maybe just a bit of tape or some wrap that has started to peel away from car 79, the car driven by Frenchman Jules Gounon, third in GT Daytona. And again, it's a similar situation that we have in Pro as we now have in the standard lineups, the regular lineups in GT Daytona. In the second, is starting to come under threat from the third place car. So yeah. Maxime Martin versus Jules Gounon, who takes plenty of curb and dust exiting turn seven this time. 
That's right, and that car, he, he, by the way, he did reset fastest lap of the race again a, a little while ago. Now he's on lap 96, actually, Guno. He's now completed lap uh, 119 in that car. Uh, but a 52.010 is the fastest lap of the race by, by Jules Guignon in a, a non-pro car. Of course, he is a fully pro driver. And that uh, 52.0 uh, uh, does... 42, 42, 52.010, yeah. That does represent a new lap record for GTD. The old one was 52.048, set by Matt Campbell back in 2019 when that Fav car went on to victory. And it's 178 laps, so uh, yeah, yeah it's a record starting to tumble a little bit. And remember, this is the same class as when it ran in 2019, GT Daytona, so we can count that as a new lap record. But uh, Shay Adam, yeah. are we expecting the Jules Gounon car in relatively shortly? And is that uh, to do with, well, that small amount of tape that's off the side of the car? Well, we weren't expecting them in, but when they saw that there was something trailing off the left side of the car, they sprang into action. Four sticker Michelin tires going onto this Mercedes, waiting on the fuel. He has actually left the debris that was hanging off the car on the fast part of the pit lane, and broken diffuser on the left side. That would be for the BMW damage. Now that car gets off and leaves, but you'll bear with me just a second. I'm actually walking back to what came off the car and it does look like a rather thin rubbery, uh, it looks like a, a liner almost to a shower that you would put in to stop the water from leaking. Rather long piece, about 20 feet worth, just uh, sitting in the fast lane now. Okay, thank you for that, Shay. So uh, another unplanned stop for a team, and it's a real shame that because Yulgunon was powering on and threatening to take second place away from Maxime Martin. There's definitely a bit of rear diffuser flapping away as well. That was snapped off. Some of the teeth of dif the diffuser was snapped off by the collision on the main straight coming out of the downhill when uh, uh, Cooper McNeil was trying to get in the pits and Conor Filippi rather didn't expect that and nose to tail contact between the white WeatherTech Mercedes and the 25 BMW at the time. 25, sadly, is uh, still behind the wall and not looking like it's going to rejoin. Same story for the Turner Motorsport BMW, which hit difficulties very early on with a misfire, which they've not been able to rectify. I was a little surprised by that, Jeremy, because I didn't think the, the whatever was uh, hanging off the side of the car was causing a massive problem, but I suppose before it develops into anything worse, perhaps? Well, yes, I mean, that, that car was last into the pits on lap 86, so that was only a, uh, what, 35 lap run. Uh, for for that team, so certainly uh, a lot earlier than would would have had uh, would have anticipated. Mm. Yeah, and uh, it's taken Jules Gounon out of the fight for a podium as things stand. Aaron Tielitz still leading the way by 13 and a bit seconds to Maxime Martin, and the man to benefit therefore is the Windward Racing pilot in their Mercedes AMG, Philip Ellis, who is co-driving with Russell Ward, as usual, in car 57. So they move up to third place in GT Daytona and sixth place overall. So it's three Daytona Pro cars that are out front. The FAF Motorsport Porsche of Matthew Jamine, the 23 Aston Martin of Heart of Racing team for Alex Riberas, and the Vassa Sullivan Racing Lexus for Ben Barnacote. The gap between those two, the Aston and the Lexus, is not very much at all. Just less than a second, and then it is from fourth position overall all the way down to 12th GT Daytona cars and a good mixture of manufacturers as well. So Lexus leading the 27 Aston in second and uh, a Mercedes dives out of the order, i.e. Jules Gounon, but is replaced by another 57. And let's not discount Brian Sellers either in the number one BMW M4 because Madison Snow led the class for a long time before that BMW's most recent pit stop. Um, well, actually, the one before that was when Brian Sellers took over, and Brian has yeah. pitted since then as well. BMW and yeah. Paul Miller Racing, mindful of all of this tyre wear, Jeremy. Yeah, slightly old strategy, I think, by that number one car. I mean, you know, they came on lap, on lap, on lap 89, and that's a bit of a driver change, uh, and then you know, less than 20 laps later, they came in with, it, with just over an hour remaining uh, to you know, be fueled to go from there, but... Very odd that they would make that uh, stop so soon. Uh, don't quite understand that because you know, they've made a lap, uh, one stop more than everybody else. So maybe the other guys have to come into the pits. But 
uh, but by the same token, they're going to be struggling, I, I think, or perhaps on fuel, or on uh, tire wear towards the end of the race. So yeah, it's certainly lost them a fair bit of track position, uh, but we'll have to see how that uh, pans out. We've just seen the number 32 car, excuse me, uh, the number th 32 car of, of Mike Skeen is running a, just a couple of seconds behind Brian Sellers, and those are the last cars on the lead lap. Weather conditions more or less perfect at just after five o'clock in the afternoon here at uh, Lakeville, Connecticut. It's RS2 IMSA Radio bringing you every single moment of the 2022 edition of the FCP Euro Northwest Grand Prix. And it is Mathieu Jaminet that is leading, heading into Big Bend for lap number 127. Still on course at the moment, I would say, for, uh, well, something close to the record distance, although that was in a more powerful or quicker GTLM car. But um, we're certainly going to be in and around the right sort of area by the end of this in 46 minutes' time. It's Jeremy Shaw and Johnny Palmer in the Haggerty Global Broadcast Centre on IMSA Radio with, Je with uh, Shea Adam, of course, keeping us wow. up to date with everything in the pit lane. Jeremy. Well, yeah, the wow there was uh, Jules Gounod just reset fastest lap of the race overall uh, at a 51.795. That's uh, that's a fantastic lap by Jules Gounod. Uh, particularly bear in mind he's never been here before, <laughs> so he's absolutely flying in that number 79 car. The bad news is uh, he's quite a long way behind. Now he's he's back in eighth position in the class, uh, and with uh, 45 minutes remaining in this race. And, well, they, they gave him practically brand new tyres in that previous stop, so he's putting them to good use. And quicker than uh, a few cars went in qualifying yesterday, that would have put him 13th on the grid, I reckon, with a 51.733. And there is uh, time yet to gain as the fuel burns off more and more for the young Frenchman. Side by side. Now, that's an interesting manoeuvre with Mathieu Jaminet allowing the Lamborghini to get through for Carbon with Peregrine Racing. So, Jeff Westphal, similar to how Matty Campbell treated Jules Gounon a little earlier on, realising there's a faster car that wants to get by, and clearly Jaminet doesn't want to push the envelope too much on fuel, so will allow the right motorsports Porsche up the inside as well of Jan Halen. So, an indication of uh, you know, the number nine FAF Motorsport Porsche not pushing to the very limit because they want to get home here. Exactly right, uh, and that's the key. Uh, they need to be able to stretch these tyres, I think, to the end of the race. Again, interesting strategy in terms of their, their tyre wear in this race and when they make their pit stops, all the leaders. But uh, yeah, they're all looking to run over an hour to the end of the race, potentially, unless they are planning one more pit stop from here on to the end. The number nine car is best placed on on the uh, tyres compared to its other contenders. And I think more than likely we're going to see more pit stops as well before the end of this race. I don't know, it's, it's curious strategies. 83 Fahrenheit in the air, a whole lot hotter than that at track level. A 1% chance of rain, if you were asking that question, by the way. So uh, very, very unlikely that uh, the weather will intervene in the closing 45 minutes. So they'll be remaining on slick tyres. and. How much rubber, how much Michelin rubber can they continue to lean on in these closing stages? Are we going to see potentially some out of sequence stops just to ensure that uh, the rubber is not burned too readily? And there's enough pace still because Mathieu Jaminet wants to measure things in the closing stages. He's only got 6.5 seconds to play with back to Alex Ribaras. And Heart of Racing team have been playing the long game as well throughout this two hour and 40 minute affair. Ben Barnacote's not too far off Rebras either, but are they actually the two of those cars working with each other to try and draw in the race leader rather than scrapping amongst themselves and potentially slowing one another down? Aaron Tielitz leading in the GT Daytona regular class. 13.8 seconds up the road from Maxime Martin. So that, for me, feels more manageable from a Vassar Sullivan racing perspective for T. Litz and his teammate Frankie Montecalvo with such a good performance in qualifying yesterday with the 51.459 that he set. At IMSA Radio, don't forget Michelin post-race tech at the end of this as well. When the chequered flag flies, that's just simply the end of the race. But the beginning 
of our discussion here on RS2 IMSA Radio after a GT3 only round of the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship. First time we've been treated to this with identical specification cars across the two GT classes within the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship. A rundown of the order with 42 minutes left on the clock and it is Jamine from Ribaras from Ben Barnico, Porsche from Faf Motorsport leading Lexus number 23, uh, sorry, Aston Martin 23 from Heart of Racing team and the number 14 Lexus of Ben Barnico. Similar car for Aaron Tielitz running in fourth place ahead of the 27 Aston Martin and Maxime Martin. The Mercedes from Windward Racing driven by Philip Ellis and it's the number one Paul Miller Racing BMW of Brian Sellers who's just ahead of Mike Skeen and that's a very tight battle as well. Mike Skeen in the number 32 Team Courtoff Motorsports car. That was your VP Racing Fuels in-race update and a tantalising scrap continues underneath the Haggerty Bridge, Jeremy Shaw, for second place overall. Yeah, indeed so. Just uh, you know, half a second or so between those two cars, maybe a fraction more on that lap particularly. Uh, but uh, generally speaking, very, very closely matched to 23 and, and number 14. And uh, the gap to the to the leader, uh, yeah, around about seven seconds. And uh, certainly we're not seeing, well, 53-0 there for the race leader, uh, Matthew Jaminet. 53-4 for Alex Ribbonras, 53-1 for Ben Barnicott and behind Ben Barnicott, Aaron Tielitz is absolutely keeping pace with the, the, the pro car in his GTD leading car number 12. Uh, that gap so around about six seconds. It's been that way for quite a long time. Yeah, and well, Maxi Martin is sort of stuck between a, a rock and a hard place at the moment. He's got a long margin to try and close in upon to the GTD uh, race leader, but equally hasn't got anybody to play with from behind, as you say. Philippe Ellis uh, a fair distance away. There's a good fight on, though, between fourth and fifth place cars. Brian Sellers in the BMW and Mike Skeen in his Mercedes. And only about six seconds behind that is Jeff Westphal in the 39 Lamborghini Huracan from Carbon with Peregrine Racing. So it's all about fourth, fifth and possibly sixth places as well with the podium yeah. positions not exactly cemented into spot, but uh, th there are larger time margins between those three currently. Yeah, it's very interesting uh, how this race is planning out. And I'm uh, just just curious to, to see you know, who else makes the pit stop perhaps before the end of this race. We've still got 40 minutes to go. Mm -hmm. So there's a long, long way to go at this stage. And uh, you know, the only car that's made three stops so far is the, um, is the number one. Uh, number 39 car has, but one of those is a penalty. Um, and, and number 79, of course, which is uh, slightly off kilter with everybody else as well. So uh, really interesting at this stage. And just looking at, you talked about uh, Brian Sellers there. Mike Skeen is definitely getting closer to Brian Sellers. And number 32 uh, uh, caught off motorsports entry is much closer now to Brian Sellers. So running, they've run to a different strategies so far in this race. The number 32 car, uh, the co-driver, Mike Skeen had to miss a race early in the season, a bit higher because he, he tested positive for COVID. So Stephen McAleer is kind of solo in the points and leads the points table coming into this race over the number 16 car. Currently, there's one car in between those uh, or in this race. So 32 car is running fifth place, posi fifth position. Between them is Jeff Westfall, number 39, who is just ahead of Jan Halen in that number 16 right motorsports Porsche. And that's three cars absolutely together, which will be Ribaras, Barnacote, and a closing Jules Gounon in the 79 WeatherTech Racing Mercedes. So Gounon, again, about to be the fly in the ointment for many drivers as he's been so far to this point. It was Cooper McNeil that started that car qualified by the American as well. 52.213 for Cooper yesterday, put him 13th on the grid, uh, but they have been working their way slowly up the order. They're running in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eighth place in Clap as I make it behind Jan Halen in the number 16 Wright Motorsports car. And uh, some progress to be made yet, quite possibly for Jules Gounon, but he's got about 10 seconds to try and find on Jan Halen, and that's not easily done. In all fairness, Jeff Westphal is the next car up the road as well. But still a, a stonking scrap between Sellers, Skeen and Westphal's not very far away. So if uh, the BMW and the Mercedes start to 
play with each other on the racetrack. That, that gap to sixth place, Jeff Westphal, will definitely start to come down. Mathieu Jaminet yeah. threading his way through the chicane on the uphill once again. This is lap 137, Jeremy Shaw. Yeah, and, and uh, pretty close behind Jeff Westphal also is Jan Halen in that right motorsports Porsche car number 16. Those are the last cars on the lead lap. So Jules Gugnon is next on the road. He's about 10 seconds behind Halen, and in between them is a race leader. So uh, Gugnon is a lap down, uh, but Halen is not at this stage as uh, Matthew Gemini completes lap 137, and we've got 36 minutes to go. But there might be an opportunity here for Ben Barnica to get ahead of Alex Ribras if he's prepared to allow Jules Gounon by, basically. Gounon is very close indeed to the number 14 Lexus. And if, as we saw earlier on from Matt Campbell in the FAF Motorsport Porsche, he's willing to concede a bit of road position, that will allow a rampant Jules Gounon through. And maybe it'll be him to prize the opening on the second place, Aston Martin from Heart of Racing Team. We're quite rightly focusing at the moment on the race leader, Mathieu Jaminet, who appears over the rise underneath the Haggerty Bridge and through the downhill once again. He does have a similar Porsche GT3R up ahead, car number 16. That is the right motorsport car of Jan Halen. So you'd have to think that the pace of both of those German cars will be fairly similar. Shea Adam has been along to the Canadian team FAF Motorsports to ask the crucial question. You never know whether you're going to get the truth or something else here, Shea, but how do they think they're set for fuel? Steve Bortolotti is pretty good about giving me the truth. Uh, he runs the FAF Motorsport program, and he said, yep, they are good on fuel. They were good on fuel. And then, you know, drivers being drivers decide to push a little harder than they'd anticipated. So they're making Jam Jam save a little bit of fuel. Every time Matthew Jamine goes into turn one, he lips a bit early, he breaks a bit early, but they are good to make it to the end of this race. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't doubt that. Uh, the, uh, the the question is, is another 12 car planning to come in again, Shay? Maybe you can find out uh, that, uh, get, get an answer to that question, because that car, number 12 car, was in um, six laps before the number nine car. And, yeah, I, I, you know, the 63, 65 minutes is certainly no problem, which is when I think the number nine car came in for its uh, second stop. But uh, the question is, can Aaron Tillits get to the end? I've, I've asked the question of that uh, team's PR department. I'm not going to answer that yet. So maybe Shay can find out the answer to that question. Oh, I noticed uh, turning light flashing briefly there on the Aston Martin, which is immediately ahead of Jules Gounon. And Alex Ribéras is willing to allow the Frenchman by here. He's making space for the 79 WeatherTech Racing Mercedes, and through will go Gounon. So that means he's unlapped himself from Ben Barnacoat, third overall, and Alex Ribéras, second overall. That suggests to me, Shay, that the Aston is fuel saving as well. Yeah, I think you're right on that, Johnny. Uh, just a quick update from Lexus. The number 14 is good to go to the end. The number 12, well, they're doing their numbers right now. Mm. Well, they'll be doing those for numbers for a while, but uh, the question is, oh, they're not going to give the answer yet. All right. Thank Still you, working you, things you. out, you see. Got their uh, shoes and socks off and uh, counting everything together. That's a, a, a useful line, which uh, doesn't answer the question, Jeremy Shaw. <laughs> well... I think, well, the fact that Ribeiras has uh, allowed Gounon through, you know, that they are not pushing Look, like crazy uh, with a mind to pit again. They are massively right. fuel-saving as right. well. Right, and, that, and, that, and again, that was not a pass for, for, for class or for, even for position on the road because the number 79 car is a lap down uh, to, the, to those leading cars. So, um, you know, it's absolutely no skin off uh, Alex Ribras's nose there to allow the number 70 car, 79 car through. Jules Gounon, he's having a whale of a time out there, I reckon, with the wheel of number 79 car. As I said earlier on, his first trip to Lime Rock, uh, showing brilliant pace, 51.733. Uh, so he actually reset a fastest lap uh, again, I think, uh, yeah, just uh, about 10 laps ago. We did it. it couple of laps in a row in actual fact so uh, 51 733 then uh, is the the new benchmark time for gtd by uh, jules gunion and yeah. the fastest lap in gtd pro by the way 
Uh, so 51.7 for Gugno, the foot for Pro, it's 52.36. That's a full six tenths of a second. Wow. Yeah, phenomenal stuff. And uh, you don't need me to list off uh, Jules Gounon's uh, title wins through the years, but he, he has won the Bathurst 12 hours on a couple of occasions. He's been a winner of the Spa 24 hours back in his Audi days with Team Santa Lock and also an ADAC GT uh, champion as well. Took three wins in season 2017, but he is rapid in whatever he climbs on board. And uh, Mercedes, you can add that to the list these days for the 27-year-old Frenchman. So a whale of a time. Unfortunately, they don't necessarily have the track position to boast about because they are 11th overall and therefore eighth in class behind Jan Halen. Uh, but that gap will have been coming down. Yes, it now stands at... Uh, well, mind you, he's had a bit of traffic to deal with as well, but it has come down very slightly from the 10 seconds that it was the last time I checked. Down the main start, finish straight here at Lime Rock Park. Alex Ribaras and Ben Barnico back together again. So they are fuel saving, remember, but they also need to leave a little bit aside to jostle for position. Threading their way now through the left-hander, through the right-hander, and now on to no-name straight for the 144th time. Shulgun on away and gone in the distance, but that hasn't altered the positions overall for the Heart of Racing team Aston Martin. Second in GT Daytona Pro and the chasing Ben Barnacote. And this has developed into a, a fuel race for these two cars. But Barnico, if he's given the opportunity, will obviously go for the move to get up to second place because of the significantly more points that are on offer. And just being kicked up a little bit on the outside of the downhill by both cars, an indication of how hard they're pushing on the exit of the bends, just probably easing out of the throttle a little more than, the, certainly a lot more than they would have been doing yesterday during the qualifying sessions. No change regarding the lead in GT Daytona, the regular class for Aaron Tielitz. And actually, Tielitz isn't too far away from Ben Barnico now. So no. those two Lexus almost sharing no name straight together, Jeremy. Absolutely. I mean, five seconds is, is the gap between those two Lexuses, is, 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 and it, it has been for, for you know, all of this stint, basically. So Aaron's certainly keeping pace with, with Ben Barnico there. The question is, does he have to make another stop before the end of this race because he's got about 16 and a half seconds in hand over Maxime Martin but that is not enough to come in and make a pit stop but there is a change for position for uh, Philip third Ellis in GTD yes Philip Ellis getting past uh, Maxime Martin yeah now I don't know what happened in the build up to that it must have been a big well, he'd bend been edging closer no he'd just been edging closer but I wonder whether that edging closer has forced a very rare mistake from Belgian driver Maxime Martin uh, like you say, the gap had been closing second to third, as it was in GT Daytona Pro as well. But, uh, both cars are likely, I think, to be overtaken by Antonio Garcia. Well, at least caught a little bit more by the repaired Corvette after its damage on the rear right corner. Remember Antonio Garcia tripping up over Jules Gounon when he was trying to make hay through the traffic as quickly as possible and sadly did damage to a tow link on the rear of that Corvette. Took the team quite a long time to repair that, and it fell to, what was it, five laps down from the GT Daytona Pro class leader. But Antonio Garcia, with some ground to make up, this would not be for position, but he might be able to get ahead of Maxime Martin. If again, Martin is in fuel save mode, and this was actually the car. Remembering back to what Shea Adam said about Maxime Martin, he's easing off the throttle on the run into Big Bend again, deliberately, so that they make the finish and to go as tenderly as possible on this set of Michelin tyres, Jeremy. Yeah, absolutely right. And I tell you what, uh, Jamini just on cruise control out in front. I think he's turning uh, every now and again, he turns a slightly quicker lap. 53-2, uh, that was the uh, last time I was fastest lap for uh, about 15 laps so uh, he's he's got things pretty much in control there i think at the front but uh, it's, uh, it's an inch yeah there's an intriguing battles uh, in their wake and that the gap now from first to second i.e from jamine to to riberas uh, almost 10 seconds last time uh, 9.7 uh, for a long time it was around about seven seconds so, so it is extended just a little bit in the last few laps 9.8 this time around 
This is RS2, IMSA Radio, with Jeremy Shaw and Johnny Palmer in the Haggerty Global Broadcast Centre. Shay Adam keeping a watching brief still down in the pit lane. We have discounted many more pit stops, Shay, but uh, did I sense a, a bit of movement from a team or two just then? indication as to whether or not they can make the end of the race that's windward racing i just went down and checked in with russell ward the starting driver of that car i said are you good on fuel and he goes eh, we'll see At the end of the race we we should be okay but uh we'll see that's not confidence inspiring well i will say that philip ellis is charging a heck of a lot harder than maxi martin right now he was happy to take the place away from the aston martin from heart of racing team and that is i'm pretty sure the aston has to come in uh, I mean, that, that was in a long, long time ago. That was about an hour and 20 to go. So I'm pretty sure the Aston has to come in. Which Aston? Um, 27 car. OK, yeah. So that's the third place car of Maxi Martin on massive yeah. fuel save, though. And yeah, true, true, true. Yeah, true so uh, for me, well, if I, if I had to choose a car in GT Daytona standard that needed a pit stop, I would say the 57 car only because Phil Ellis is pushing like crazy. He wanted to close the gap on Maxime Martin. He wanted to take the place. And uh, how do his lap times compare now, Philip Ellis, to Aaron Thielen? So he's got 15 odd seconds to try and find. So it might be a case of just, we're, we're in second. Let's try and hold on to that as long as there's enough fuel in the tank, Jeremy. Yeah, and as long as the tyres will last uh, towards the end of the race as well. Uh, I mean, you know, if he's been on fuel safe now and he's just turned up the wick, he reckons he can get to the end from here. Uh, fair enough. Uh, because la last time around, uh, the Mercedes of Bill Ellis was about uh, half a second quicker than Aaron Tillett. So we'll see whether that is a trend that will continue. Yeah. Well, clearly, Philip Ellis felt that uh, the speed of Maxime Martin was actually slowing him up more than anything else, so took the opportunity to squeeze by. I think it was less of a mistake from Martin and more just a, well, yeah, you have the road position because we think we'll make the finish. And we'll just see where the 57 car is at the end of it because uh, there's going to be a lot of um, potential overtakes that we think are for or competitive overtakes, but actually teams are thinking about so much more the long game and where they're going to be on the podium when the chequered flag is waved. Remember, the chequered flag will come out according to where the overall leader is, which may force the GT Daytona class leader into an extra lap, although probably not, because there's very little between Ben Barnacote and Aaron Tielitz. We have got yeah. nose to tail cars on the racetrack now, though, and Mathieu Chamonet again being caught by that pesky Jules Gounon, who just will not go away, Jeremy. No, he won't, and uh, you know, he's, he's only now, the gap from Gounon to Jan Halen is only 5.7 seconds, uh, so uh, it was 10 seconds, eight laps ago. So Gounon is certainly charging along here, and uh, I'm sure I'll be surprised if Jamie just didn't let him go uh, here. Yeah, well, we've seen that uh, from another number of different cars through the course of the race. We've seen it from the Porsche when it was in the hands of Matt Campbell as well. So maybe a quick word in the ear from FAF Motorsports to say, pick a space where there is enough off-road for Jules Gounon to go at. No name straight is tricky because it's far from a straight. There's lots of kinks down there, but there's always the opportunity maybe on the run up into West Bend from the chicane that they are exiting now to allow the Mercedes to draw alongside. Also behind Jules Gounon is a hard charging Ryan Eversley in the Rick Ware Racing prepared Acura NSX GT3, the Rick Ware, entered, Rick Ware Racing entered car number 51 that is running in 12th position overall. So ninth place in GT Daytona and through will go Jules Gounon as expected. So that was actually Jaminet just fainting out of the throttle into Big Bend lose very little time doing it that way and now the Mercedes can scamper away into the distance not a move for position but to remove a headache for Mathieu Jaminet Jeremy indeed so and now Jaminet can set, set sight uh, on the uh, car ahead of him which would be uh, Jan Halen who's about six seconds up the road so as he crests the hill here uh, can he see him at West Bend not sure I couldn't quite see um, Maybe not quite, perhaps, but uh, I think before too long, Gunor is going to have the, the car of Jan Halen in his sights, and only a second ahead of Jan Halen is Jeff Westfall, and only a couple of seconds up the road from him are both Brian Sellers and Mike Skeen. So uh, lots to play for here 
for that number 79 car. It's the FCP Euro Northeast Grand Prix live from Lime Rock Park, round nine of the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship for 2022. Looking forward to what the final 22 minutes has to give. And I do sense for some teams there's going to be a little bit of a tweak in the tail here. Maybe the need to pit if the, the dial is reading absolutely zero. You'd sooner get in for a splash and get whatever points you can muster rather than touring, slowing down on that final lap and not getting a result at all. But uh, there are certain cars that we're pretty sure that can make the finish because of how they're behaving out on track. And Mathieu Jamade, one of those cars, the number nine, looking absolutely fine for its fuel load. But uh, Aston, Aston Martin and the Ben Barnacoat uh, car of the, the Lexus for Vassar Sullivan um, may be easing up on the fuel load. Shea Adam reporting something has happened at the final corner. And it might well be the 51 Acura NSX that was right on the tail of the Porsche. And I notice he's no longer there because Ryan Eversley was right with Mathieu Jaminet at the end of the lap. And now, what was I saying about a tweak in the tail, Jeremy Shaw? We have been green from the start of this race. It is Ryan Eversley's NSX, which has ended up into the tyre wall, underneath the tyre wall, sadly, for the Rick Ware racing car of Aidan Reed and Ryan Eversley, the current driver. No idea what happened there. Ryan is moving around in the cockpit, I'm delighted to say, and he now offers a thumbs up to the onboard camera. But there's a rather battered and bruised Acura NSX, and crucially, Jeremy, it's a full course caution with the pit lane closed initially. Yeah, that's right. 21 minutes to go. Is anybody going to come in and gamble and pull on some fresh tyres, perhaps, mm. and go to the end from here? Let's have a look, see if we can see. Uh, this is at West Bend. And uh, that was uh, Jaminy straying a couple of uh, wheels off the road. And it was a, wow, gosh. Oh. Ouch. Yeah. yeah. Coming down the downhill there, just get carried a little bit too much speed into the corner. The car understeered mid, mid corner off the road. and. Yeah, we've seen that before. There's not much you can do at that stage. You're heading off there at very, very high speed and uh, unable to get that car. I mean, once you're on the grass, you're a, you're a passenger. Maybe so. a slow puncture that caused that. We were talking about tyre wear being so crucial around here. Equally, it might just be that Ryan just got half a car width off the racing line into the marbles and then they just suck you in. It was a little bit similar to Aidan Reed's incident in the same car at Big Bend much, much earlier on in the race when he skated off at turn two and needed to scrabble back onto the circuit. But it was a strange old incident, that. Bit of dust being kicked up by the race leader immediately in front of him, Mathieu Jaminet. So uh, the track was dirty offline. And if you push a bit too hard into the downhill, very easy for the car to escape away, but uh, the impact was frightening there. The tyres doing their job, but the cars actually ended up partly underneath the tyre wall and very difficult, therefore, for Ryan to get out of the car because he's sitting on the left side of the car, exactly the section of uh, NSX, which is underneath the rubber right now. Yeah, that was a frightening impact there for Ryan. I mean, you know what's coming. As soon as you run wide onto the grass there, the exit of the downhill, you know you're in trouble. Uh, yeah, you can you can try slinging the car sideways, but on grass that really doesn't do a whole heck of a lot. So uh, he was just a passenger there. A really scary impact for Ryan, and good to see he's okay. But real shame for him and that team that had a, a great result last time out at Canadian Time Sport Park. Not been uh, nearly successful uh, today, but again more experience for that new team to the uh, to the championship this season. But uh, good job there by the. Uh, AMR safety team to get that car out of the way already and you know, with a bit of luck we'll have sort of 10 minutes or so to go uh, of, of green and uh, how, how important was that pass for Jules Gunion to get himself back on the lead lap? Well, mm. potentially very important. Yeah, so are we going to see that WeatherTech Racing take a new set of tyres uh, in the closing stages of this race? Unfortunately for Jules and anybody else that's looking to gather up some lost ground in the from the opening stages. They will only have about 15 minutes to play with here uh, when the pit lane is officially open. Good to see that the Acura has now been released from its landing position. Uh, Ryan Eversley was very quick indeed from the cockpit to put his thumbs up to the onboard camera and Shay Adam has received some confirmation from Rick Ware Racing that Ryan is OK inside that car, although a little bit uh, bruised perhaps from the impact. 
there's not a lot of uh, space in these cockpits. You're crammed in there. They're ergonomically designed to have everything at your fingertips. Um, but uh, the safety net, which is strung across the side window, will have helped uh, contain Ryan within the seat. And, of course, you're, you're buckled down in a six-point harness as well, so not going anywhere fast. That car will be retrieved, recovered now, and that's the reason why they are removing the nose cover to expose the towing hoop and uh, get that car recovered as quickly as possible. My fear is that the tyre wall will need to be repaired to make that safe again should it take uh, impact once more. Uh, meanwhile, Shay, you're paying close attention to what is happening in the pit lane. Corvette Racing just made a trip down the pits. Now, why is this important? Pit lane is still closed, so they just did a drive-through. You guys asked about new tires. Well, I'm doing some snooping, and so far, I only see two teams on the pit lane that have any sets of new Michelins, one of those being Wright Motorsport. That might be worth giving Jan Halen a new set of boots for the Porsche, the other being the Carbon Lamborghini. Jeff Westfall likes new tires, too. Yes, and uh, there'll be many that are not in a strong position right now who are well and truly up for rolling the dice here because you never know where you might end up for going way outside of the box on strategy in the closing stages. A reason to very much stick with this on RS2 IMSA Radio, part of the Radio Show Limited network of channels. It's Jeremy Shaw and Johnny Palmer, a treat for me this year to be calling one of the IMSA WeatherTech sports car races here on IMSA Radio, live from the Haggerty Broadcast, the Global Broadcast Centre. And the what is left now of the Acura NSX being towed up onto the flatbed. Hopefully much of that damage is superficial, but they will have to check clearly the safety cell, the tub of that car um, with, well, how long to go, Jeremy, before the next round of this championship? Is there a sufficient uh, segment of time to get the car repaired, ready for the next outing? Yes, yeah, a couple of weeks uh, until we go to Road America as the next round of the championship. Is it? No, no, it's three weeks away. I can't remember, to be honest. Yeah, it's probably three weeks, isn't it, to Road America? 7th of August weekend. Yeah, yeah, so 22, yeah, three weeks. So, yeah, plenty of time to get that car back again for that. And, uh, yeah, disappointing end to that team's day for sure because they've shown uh, really good form in the last few races. And Aidan Reid has, has, has very much impressed as a, as a driver. Um, the, the question, though, is this tyre wall down there, is that going to mm -hmm. require some significant repairs? Yeah, you're absolutely right there, Johnny Palmer. And, that's going to be the concern right now. There's only 14 minutes, less than 15 minutes remaining in this race. And if they've got to redo the tire wall down there, then that could take up um, most or all, even all of that time. Hope not. Let's hope not. We might have a five minute dash to the finish of this race, but uh, yeah, uh, it depends what the backing of those tires uh, is, whether there's Armco behind there or whether it was just kind of grass bank with tire wall. No, there doesn't appear to be any Armco barrier behind the three deep tires. So now we're hearing, Shay, that uh, the pits won't open at all. Is that what you just said in my ears? Short yellow has been called for, which means that uh, there is no pass around and the pits will not open. So when we are good to go back to racing, we're just going to go back to racing. Well, the very large rubber belt on the front of the tyre strands, or the tyre bale, if you like, well, the tyre wall, actually, rather than bale strung together, is being worked back into position. And uh, they're using one of the recovery trucks, the crane uh, attachment, if you like, on the back of the Lime Rock Park uh, truck, to pull those back into a vague shape again. But they've got to make sure, of course, that um, everything is safe in case anybody else falls off on that part of the circuit in the closing stages but a short yellow bearing in mind i can only assume jeremy that the end of the race is 13 and a bit minutes away yeah well anytime within a half an hour to the end of the race if there's a full course caution it is designated a full course and so they don't go through all the uh, the pits opening and and, and drive and uh, wave past procedures so just to reset the classes well there aren't any classes to reset yeah. in this race uh, so, yeah, it's because it was within the final half hour of the race, uh, I think the yellow came out with 21 minutes remaining, then, uh, yes, that's why it's a, a, a short yellow. Let's give you the order as things stand. Absolutely no distance now, of course, between the three GT Daytona Pro cars and 
the GT Daytona regular car. So the Lexus from Vassar Sullivan are nose to tail under this full course caution. Mathieu Jaminet leading in the number nine Faf Motorsports Porsche 911 GT3R in the plaid colours. Then it is the heart of racing team Aston Martin Vantage AMR of Alex Riberas, the car that was started by Ross Gunn, car 23 second. Third position is the 14 Vassar Sullivan Racing Lexus RCF of Ben Barnico now earlier in the hands of Jack Hawksworth. And fourth place, the sister car from Vassar Sullivan Racing for Aaron Tielitz. Exactly the same specification of car, it's just got different coloured door mirrors. The green door mirrors for car number 12 indicating that it leads the secondary class. Third, uh, second position within that GT Daytona regular is the 57 Winward Racing Mercedes AMG of Russell Ward and currently Philip Ellis doing the driving. He's ahead of Maxime Martin, who's been massively on fuel save mode. If we do go back to green, all those cars that were saving fuel will be absolutely fine to the finish. And therefore, that's why we're, we can't wait for this race to get going again, because they'll be charging hard to the finish. Car 27 is third within GT Daytona. Fourth position for the number one Paul Miller Racing BMW M4 of Brian Sellers, sharing that with Madison Snow. Team Kortoff's number 32 car for Mike Skeen, the Mercedes AMG number 32, is in the next position, fifth in GT Daytona standard. And then it is the 39 car barn with Peregrine Racing, Lamborghini Huracan of Jeff Westphal. That was your VP Racing Fuels in race update here on RS2 IMSA Radio. And I reckon the crews are now scampering away because they are happy with their repairs on the tyre wall on the exit of the downhill. And it's looking very likely, Jeremy Shaw, sharing the Haggerty Global Broadcast Centre as you do with me, that we're going to get a restart here. Yeah, and I thought it was going to be about 10 minutes uh, to go in this race. Uh, it's going to be a little bit less than that, but um, it's still going to be a fight to the finish. And there's going to be, you know, at least... Uh, well, at least eight or nine laps, I would imagine, if we can get these uh, safety team out of the way. I'm sure they will be doing that as quickly as they can. Uh, so the, the the car out there with the newest or least old tyres is number 79 car, which is last on the field, the last of the cars on the lead lap, at least, in 11th position. Uh, he, was, he made his uh, final pit stop uh, 41 uh, laps ago, lap 120. Uh, the, the car in prior to that was 12 laps uh, earlier. That was the number one. So those are the two cars with the, the tyres that have uh, had least running of the cars that are still on the racetrack. And heading out now of the downhill, or rather, sorry, the uphill chicane through 5A and 5B, as I'm going to start to call them now, in the closing 10 minutes, through the right-hander at West Bend. And backing everybody up but now going for a restart is Mathieu Jaminet as he heads into the downhill turn number seven he has just about got a jump on Alex Riberas and Riberas immediately defensive also Philip Ellis charging hard on the car ahead of him which is the race leader in GT Daytona Aaron Tielitz can Tielitz hold Ellis back yes just about but to the high side of Alex Riberas is now Ben Barnico but Barnico's shuffled out of that one as well there is a lead change for GT Daytona though as Philip Ellis wastes absolutely no time at all in the Windward racing car he's ahead of Aaron Tielitz in the number 12 Lexus what else is changing well well, Mathieu Jaminet is just driving away into the sunset with eight and three quarter minutes to go, Jeremy. Told you he had everything in control, didn't he? He looked uh, super under control all the way through, well, all, pretty much all the way through this race. In actual fact, he had to give up the lead for the middle stages, but he's just uh, lit a fire and disappeared at the front of the field. Uh, stunning first lap here for Mathieu Jaminet on the restart, but yeah, all sorts of shuffling behind. So there was a lead change, and Aaron Tielitz, has he got enough now up his sleeve to hold back the ever closer. Oh, there's damage to Tielitz, it's car. And now to the inside line will go the number one car of Brian Sellers to take second position, I think, away of Clash. Surely Tielitz isn't going to be able to deal with that flapping bonnet, which is starting to obscure his vision, no doubt. And they're all queuing up behind him. Maxime Martin in the number 27, Aston Martin looking for a way by Vahada Racing Team. Mike Skeen is in that queue as well. And that's only going to get worse, Jeremy. It's some, somehow become detached the bonnet on the front right and is starting to cause massive problems for Aaron Tielitz's visibility. 
It certainly is, and Brian Sellers there absolutely on a charge. He got past number 27 car of Maxime Martin at the restart as well. He's also now got past uh, uh, Aaron Tiedlitz, so I think the second position now for Brian Sellers in that number one car. Wow, this race has really come alive for that team. One of those ones you had to stick with because it looked uh, very kind of open in terms of the uh, final positions, rather cemented in, into position, but it's all changing now because Keep an eye out, by the way, for Jules Gounon, as all of a sudden, right over the kerbs, there goes Aaron Tielitz. He can't pick his turning point with the bonnets trying, trying to uh, part company from the rest of the car, so that's a whole load more positions lost at Big Ben for Aaron Tielitz in the Vassar Sullivan car. The Lamborghini of Jess Westphal has just got through, but Jules Gounon is still tucked in behind the right motorsports car of Jan Halen, and Gounon could yet make waves, as he's been trying to do all race long. So it was side-to-side -side contact in the overtake from Philip Ellis, which has caused this damage, and for the bonnet to start to rise on Aaron Tielitz's car side to side. It wasn't as clean a mover as I had, had first thought from Philip Ellis. He was trying to close the door. How do you call that, Jeremy? You are supposed to allow a car width uh, when you're still overlapping. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, right, absolutely right. <laughs> Uh, Maybe I'll answer my own is, uh, question. Give, given up that game, and he's into the pits now for some uh, f for some uh, attention to that car. Incident involving cars 12 and 57 reviewed. No action. Very interesting. So race control. So race. So race control suggesting that Philip Ellis was within his own rights to defend the exit of Big Bend. And uh, Shay Adam, what have they done to repair that Lexus? They took the hood off, Johnny. They did nothing to address the damage to the right front bumper, but at least Aaron will be able to see where he's going. Race control was looking at that. They were getting ready to call a mechanical flag on him. Good thing that he came in the pits that time. Shouldn't be an issue with engine cooling now because the air is blowing right at that uh, five litre V8 then for Aaron Tielitz. And that will immediately eliminate the problem with him peering out the front to see where he's going. Now, the other Vassar Sullivan Lexus is under pressure from the same man, Philip Ellis, who leads Needs GT Daytona, but might not be happy with that. It's all about the gap that he can build, I suppose, on Brian Sellers at the head of the class, but he'll be looking for a way by, if at all possible, on Ben Barnacode as well. Hopefully it's a cleaner manoeuvre than, uh, than Ellis was able to do on the exit of Big Ben last time around, but Ellis is not messing about here. Lights flashing in the braking area for the chicane at turn five. Through, they will thread their, themselves up the uphill and onto the back straight between Ben Barnacote, third overall, and Ellis, who wants a third place overall at the end of this. Over the rise they go, underneath the Haggerty Bridge and through the downhill, Ellis, is in the place he wants to be here, Jeremy. Uh, is he wise to kind of stick with what he's got or get even further up the order? Well, the last lap for our Brian Sellers was fractionally quicker. They come across the line now to complete lap 168. Let's have a look at the lap times. Uh, and Ellis was actually slightly quicker on that last lap time. Uh, slightly quicker on that. No, he wasn't. Sellers was quicker again on, on that last lap. So, uh, yeah. This is going to be an interesting fight there towards the end there. Brian Sellers bringing company with him, including Maxime Martin no, in the third-placed uh, Aston Martin from Hart Racing Team. Four minutes to go on the clock. Mathieu Jaminet appearing to have this in the bag. Door open very slightly by Ben Barnacote, but Philip Ellis wasn't close enough to stab his class-leading 57 Windward Racing Mercedes up the inside to back third overall. He might just be happy to sit there now in fourth position in the draft of Ben Barnico, knowing he's got 1.5 seconds clear. Jules Gounon trying to make a move on Jan Halen further back in the pack. That would be for sixth position in GT Daytona. And Gounon, who's been a lap down this afternoon, worked his way to the lead lap and could yet finish in the top five. He's got Halen standing in his way. Maxi Martin looking for a way by the number one BMW of Brian Sellers. And you can hear in the background the V8 of Mike Skeen's Mercedes, 6.2 litre in the nose of this car, heading into the braking area for the uphill once again. Three cars immediately together there, but there are a two or three right behind as well. It's uh, the Lamborghini that is right on the tail of Mike Skeen, then a small gap back to Jan Halen, who's being picked off by Jules Gounon. Just under three minutes to go. 
and the finishing order off the podium places within GT Daytona could be anything, Jeremy Shaw. It certainly could, and uh, Brian Sellers is, uh, is now not quite able to match that pace of, uh, of, of Phil Ellis, who's set the fastest lap in a couple of races this season. They've had, uh, they've had uh, you know, some, a strong pace in the number 57 car, but uh, not yet the win until perhaps now. So they're certainly pushing hard. Uh, and uh, looking good at the moment. That's Phil Ellis in that wind of racing coming on 57. The concern here is that the track is so dirty offline that if you launch your way into the marbles in an attempted overtake, you could go skating off into the scenery, very similar to how, uh, unfortunately, Ryan Eversley left proceedings not too long ago. So that is so tricky around this bull ring at Lime, at Lime Rock Park, heading out of the final corner at turn seven and over the line again. Ben Barnacote separated by a couple of car lengths, if that, back to the GT Daytona leader, Philip Ellis. Daytona Pro still led by young Frenchman Mathieu Jaminet by just under two seconds. Alex Riberas in second position in the 23 Aston Martin. And then it's Ben Barnacote with his hands full of this Philip Ellis Mercedes looking for a way by, but is not as forceful um, of an attack from the German than we saw to take the class lead, and you can understand why. Heart in mouth moment, possibly, for Matty Campbell. I think he's very, feeling relatively relaxed, though, at the top of the Pratt perch, uh, peering down at Mathieu Jaminet and elsewhere within Lexus. Oh, and off for Jan Halen, and that will have given a place to uh, Jules Gounon, as long as Jules kept things on the straight and narrow as well. 16 car of Wright Motorsport has fallen behind Gounon, and possibly Aaron Tielitz as well in that repaired or at least uh, minus some bodywork Lexus. What happened here then? Was there contact? Yes, there certainly was yes. from Jules Gounon. Fairly easy to read that one, Jeremy Shaw, in my opinion at least. Yeah, at uh, the uphill chicane there. Got, certainly appeared to get attacked from behind on the braking. Unsettled the number 16 car and around went the Porsche. So that's uh, kind of cost him another position. Uh, I think he was probably able to get going again before Aaron Tielitz uh, was onto the scene, but uh, that'd be very disappointing for that number 16 team. Yeah, a real shame that, and also for Jules Gounon as well. well depends uh, how the officials look at that. 21 seconds to go on the clock, heading through the downhill now for the race leader and kicking up the dust, not an inch of letting up because he's got 1.9 seconds Still to go, heading down into Big Bend, 1.9 seconds as a buffer margin, that is, uh, with uh, the final lap called now. So the white flag was out for Mathieu Jaminet, 2.1 seconds to the good of Alex Riberas. Still not a moment to kind of let the concentration drain away, but uh, Jaminet is just not of that type, really. He will stay utterly focused on the end goal here. And the restart was key as he headed out of West Bend and through towards the downhill, got the jump on Alex Riberas, and Riberas was not able to offer a response. Ben Barnacode has been far more focused on the closing of Philip Ellis. Brian Sellers should be OK for second position now with Maxime Martin running in third. But it's a, been a superb drive, really, for two days running from FAF Motorsports of Canada and for Matty Campbell and Mathieu Jaminet. They had to do it the hard way with that very late full course caution with 22 minutes left on the clock. Oh, a car slowing down. Now, has that made the line? Is that the 57 That's the car? car? That's the Winwood car that is running out of fuel. So a complete change of order at the close stages it is Brian Sellers and Madison Snow who will win the race in GT Daytona as the 57 Winwood car was so tight on fuel we mentioned how hard Phil Ellis was pushing mainly for track position but it is Madison Snow and, and Brian Sellers who wins and Brian Sellers absolutely ecstatic in the cockpit let's hear from his teammate now with Shay this is amazing Madison I don't think anyone expected Happened. They thought they were good on fuel after that long yellow, but I guess they pushed a little too hard. Your opening stint and Brian's stint there, that won this race. How does it feel? Two-time winners at Lime Rock Park. I mean, it's awesome to win. I mean, we weren't Holy looking crap. so good under the yellow, and I'm always I'm sitting there talking on the timing stand, like, do we want it to go green? Do we not want it to go green? Do we want to stay yellow? Yellow is a safe fourth. Are we going to, I mean ended up going back green not knowing what was going to happen and <laughs> ended up on the top step of the podium through the last corner 
two sprint wins now, and for your sprint rivals, they had terrible days. This is even better for you guys in the championship. It means a little bit of pressure's off for Road America and VIR, doesn't it? I mean, right now, who cares about the championship? We got a race win. Congrats, Madison. Thank you, Mad Dog. Thank you. There's the reaction from Paul Miller Racing. And how's your luck, Jeremy Shaw? Because the 57 car of Philip Ellis, I mean, it lost power basically between turn six and seven. The penultimate corners on the racetrack, but they are all the most important. Yeah, I mean, and there's a downhill as well. He's, he, was, he was able to, to coast home to finish. If that was Road America. Uh, running out of fuel in the last corner, he wouldn't have made to the finish line. So, uh, heartbreak for that team. And man, I tell you what, I'd, I'd rather be lucky than good, uh, but it's even better when you're lucky and good. And that's certainly the case for Brian Sellers and uh, Madison Snow. I mean, they were out for the count here before that uh, late, late caution period. They'd made one more stop than everybody else, uh, which is a slightly curious strategy, uh, certainly the way they, the, when they made their stops, but it's worked out. I mean, you know, they, they were they were way out of it. They were running in the uh, in the fourth position, which which was which was pretty good. But they come away with the victory there as a result of uh, everybody else having problems of some sort or another. So uh, hats off to that team. Uh, Maxi Martin comes home with the second position again. Then for Heart of Racing team, so two more seconds for that Heart of Racing team, Aston Martin team in both GTD Pro and in GTD. Wow. It was such a delicate overtake from Brian Sellers because he was out in the marbles quite sensibly. Uh, Phil Ellis was putting his Mercedes right in the middle of the racetrack to make it as difficult to pass as possible. But it was sort of a, an overtake in slow motion, if you like. And Brian Sellers very nearly running into the 57 Windward Mercedes. Philip Ellis eventually finishing in fifth, as you've mentioned. Uh, but uh, a big question of what might have been. They were so close. Had the racetrack finished two corners earlier, that would have been a race win for Windward Race for Russell Ward and for Philip Ellis. But uh, we know how hard uh, Phil was pushing in the middle stages to overtake before the full course yellow and then, of course, to wrestle the race lead away from Aaron Tielitz in a manoeuvre that was judged, to be fair, no further action required between the 57 and the 12. Lexus coming out of Big Bend. Shea Adam is in the crucial positions down on pit road for reaction uh, for this motor race. We've talked an awful lot, understandably, about GT Daytona regular Shea, but we must catch up, catch up with our Daytona Pro winners. Yep, and it's the second win for FAF Motorsport at Lime Rock Park. And Maddie Campbell, it must feel pretty good. Yeah, bloody awesome. I mean, to lead from the front uh, most of the race, obviously a different strategy, but uh, yeah, we made it work. And... And uh, yeah, fantastic job at the hug crew and, and on strategy and we were able to bring it home. So uh, it wasn't easy out there for sure. We had to fight the car a lot. You know, degradation here is so high, but uh, I feel like we were able to manage well and, and really do a good job. You know, I think it really helped being out front and clean the air a lot of the time. And, and I think that really made our race today. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Cheers. A terrific race, which just reached a natural crescendo there with the late caution. A real unfortunate situation for Ryan Eversley. And we hope that that car is repairable in the three weeks that separate this round from the next. But uh, it actually drummed up a phenomenal finish. And congratulations to FAF Motorsport and to Paul Miller Racing with the most unlikely victory. Coming down the back straight, they were definitely settling for second position in GT Daytona. It's been a delight to call this race for you on RS2 IMSA Radio. And remember, the chequered flag is just the start of our conversation with the Michelin post-race tech, which is next. Oh, brilliant stuff. Uh, thank you to Johnny Palmer and to Jeremy Shaw, Chair Adam. It's John Hindorf back in the Haggerty Global Broadcast Centre for Michelin Post Race Tech. 
Take a deep breath, everybody, after that one, uh, with Faf Motorsports winning from the front ahead of Heart of Racing team, who clocked up two second places. Another, another two podium for Heart of Racing in their Aston Martins. Vassa Sullivan in third in GTD Port Pro. Uh, and what a comeback for Carbon with Peregrine in the rented Lamborghini Huracan. <laughs> but what a finish for Paul Miller Racing. Brilliant, brilliant stuff. Jeremy Shaw is alongside me. He'll be rapidly doing the uh, rapidly doing uh, all of the points. Uh, let's see if we can get down to Shea. Hopefully Shea can hear me uh, as well for a little more uh, of the atmosphere uh, in the scrum behind the pit lane heading towards the uh, heading towards the victory circle after a phenomenal race. Jeremy, to you first of all for some points updates. Yeah, uh, of course, uh, with the, the fourth win of the season, Matt, Matt, Matt Campbell and Matthew Jamini actually dominating GTD Pro. So they now lead by uh, 215 points unofficially, 24.41 to 22.26 for the Corvette that even though they had problems today come home with fourth place points so they remain ahead of uh, Ben Barnicott uh, by uh, 45 points unofficially uh, he's in third position and then just 11 points back to the second place finishes today Ross Gunn and uh, Alex Riveras in the in the manufacturer's championship in uh, GTD Pro once again a uh, Porsche extending their lead uh, over uh, it'll now be Aston Martin, I think, up into second place ahead of uh, Lexus. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I think Aston Martin will move ahead into second position there in the GTD Pro manufacturer points, John. Uh, share your shout up uh, once you've got some more interviews. Well, head. Uh, oh, I can hear you. Uh, let's see if we can go straight to Shea uh, uh, and Alex Riberas, who uh, is, uh, has a big smile on his face, Shea. Oh, you know it. I mean, there's no cameras on him, but you know that Alex is smiling after that drive. It was such a crazy race. To come home with a podium is one thing, but to put yourself further back into the championship after a good finish here, it's got to make it feel even better. Oh, my God, what a day. To be honest, it's, it's been a tough day out here. Lime Rock, you know, everybody knows it's tough on the tires. And to do uh, uh, more than an hour in that last stint, we had to work uh, so hard in the car. We were constantly try trying to manage the tire pressures, trying to manage the tire life. But at the same time, you had pressure from behind and we had the GTD cars that were completely in the mix. They were on different strategies, on different uh, windows of performance uh, of, of their stint. So that, that made it really exciting. To be honest, I enjoyed a lot. I had a lot of fun and uh, to come home with a third podium in a row for us in the 23 car and again the 27 car completely in the mix for the championship roman is is a man on a mission right now i'm really really happy for the team is it harder for you as a driver when you're doing lots of little stints or lots of long stints i think both of them has, have its own like unique difficulties sometimes a short stint can be really really tough because you have to completely be on the edge because you know you, you're gonna take everything out of the tire but at the same time how much can you push really it's really hard because it's not a quality you still need to take care of the tire a little bit but you need to push while on the on the longer stay on, on the longer stuff it's uh, it's really demanding mentally to be always making no mistakes always adapting to what the car is doing the tires are doing while keeping an eye on everything that's happening around you I think that's that's something challenging that I personally really, really love doing. And I mean, what a day. You, you never know when you have such a good run as we are having right now. So we really have to make sure we don't take this for granted and we enjoy it as a team. Yeah, for sure. Lots of double podiums, both cars on the podium. That that feels great. But you've got something big coming up next for Heart of Racing on the calendar, the 24 hours of Spa. How do you carry this momentum forward there? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm, I'm so excited for that race, especially racing over there with Ross. Uh, TF Sport, which is a phenomenal team. So we're, we're going there with a lot of hope. Obviously, it's a super, super tough field out there. Uh, but after this fantastic run that we are, that we are having in a second podium today, uh, third podium today in a row, I think uh, we are definitely full of energy for Spa and really, really excited about it. Thanks, Alex. Good luck. Thank you. Thanks to you. Thank you to everybody. Yeah, good to hear Alex there. Mission and Post Race Tech 
Uh, we're still on the pier at Lime Rock Park as well. We'll hand over for the formalities shortly if you want to keep listening to us, XM. Uh, Sirius XM 207 or of course on RS2 via imsaradio.com uh, imsaradio.com uh, and uh, just a, a quick opportunity to say thank you to all of our technical team our camera operators uh, and everybody involved in the broadcast here at Lime Rock Park and indeed further afield it's been a very busy day for our colleagues uh, at, uh, at NASCAR Productions making sure we can see all around the track here plus the Toronto Porsche Carrera Cup race presented by Visit Cayman Islands. Thanks to Courtney and the team at Toronto and to everybody up in Charlotte uh, as well for a busy day. Uh, Jeremy, what a race. What a race. A uh, couple of people uh, saying, uh, right turn lover from the centre of Europe says, can we please get a prototype type class back? I enjoy uh, if I enjoy GT3 car classes differing only by the enigma of driver racings, I'd rather watch SR, or I would rather watch uh, uh, SRO racing. Um, we, we've always had a couple of GT races in GT only races in IMSA competition, but it has changed now, hasn't it? Because we have only got one GT category. I, I'm, I'm not sure that any of the P cars um, would be suitable around this track now. I think they may well have outgrown this circuit. Yeah, that's my uh, take as well, John. I completely agree with you there. Look, I, I thought this was a tremendous race. Um, and, that, and that's the great thing about, about this championship, I think. It, you know, if we had all the prototype cars here as well, it would have been chaos in terms of uh, cautions and potential. the potential for accidents uh, with that speed differential would be huge. And this was a great race. I mean, yes, there was just that one incident towards the end there, which is really unfortunate for Ryan Eversley, of course. Other than that, it was a nice, clean, all green, flat out, tremendous motor race. That's, to me, what it's all about.